All right, we're ready to get started again. So I have the honor of introducing our guest today. Uh, my name is Tony Hansen, if you don't know me, from St. Cloud State. Uh, those of you who have attended the Heads and Chairs meeting over the last decade, certainly, are aware that we have discussed accreditation a couple of times in the past. Uh, the, I believe the first time we did it was probably six or eight years ago, and it was discussed in very general terms. Uh, as I recall that meeting, it was very entertaining. Uh, I organized this, I think, six years ago. We had a group from Canada that's actually accrediting atmospheric science programs in Canada. Uh, that was very entertaining. Uh, at the time, uh, we had one of the chairs in attendance was actually an engineer, and he was able to talk about ABET a little bit. Uh, Kevin, I think Kevin and I had some conversations. The board discussed accreditation again probably a year and a half ago. And we thought, well, this would be a nice forum to talk about it again. And why don't we bring someone from ABET uh, to talk to us about what ABET really does to dispel any misconceptions that may exist. Uh, I contacted the office of ABET just out of the blue, uh, I think in May, I think it was. Uh, they gave me Amanda Reed's uh, contact information. And I said, this is who I am. This is what we like. Could you guys please send someone to our meeting to talk to us about what ABET could do uh, in collaboration with the AMS? Uh, when she got back to me, it was like, oh yes, definitely. Uh, we are very interested in that. So I'm very pleased that we have two people today. Uh, this session is going to be kind of free form like we were in the morning. We have presentations from Dr. Milligan uh, and then from Amanda Reed. And so uh, let me introduce Dr. Milligan first. Uh, he is the executive director of ABET. A uh, little background, uh, he has a PhD in electrical engineering. You can see all the letters after his name up there. Uh, he was on the faculty at the uh, Air Force Academy for a part of his career. And I don't know if you have any other, is your ABET or your goes R slide in your presentation? Well, I don't know who's controlling the slides. The slides are from back there. Well, there is a little goes, uh, It's not, it's not in this slide, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a separate presentation. There's one that says goes R on it. I told Michael he didn't have to explain what goes R is to this audience. So with that, uh, uh, Dr. Milligan. Right. Thanks very much. And uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Colorado, so I really enjoy coming back. Although I have to tell you, I was quite surprised when I got off the flight this morning because I came from Baltimore where it was muggy in the 70s and here we are and uh, quite different, but refreshing in a good way, you know. So um, as Tony mentioned, uh, I spent uh, 25 years of my um, life in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, I did lots of different things, very interesting things. And I thought it would be worth talking a little bit about, uh, before I get into the, the ABET discussion, a little bit about what I did because I have a real connection with all of you, I think. Uh, my last four years in the Air Force, I worked for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and I funded primarily space weather research uh, in uh, at an office in the United Kingdom in London. So there's a lot of work uh, being done, especially in the Scandinavian countries. I don't know if any of you are involved in space weather kind of work. Uh, but then when I retired and, and moved back to the U.S. Uh, and settled in Maryland, I ended up working uh, at NASA Goddard um, uh, Research Center, and I worked on a program, GOZAR. And it was very uh, satisfying because, of course, there's some weather, space weather instrumentation on, on the GOES platform. Uh, I worked on the ground segment, uh, not on the, on, the, on, the, on the payload part. Uh, but it was very satisfying because within a relatively short amount of time, and if you, uh, in my perspective, being in the Air Force programs, they cost lots of many millions of dollars, take forever to get fielded. The GOES went pretty, pretty smoothly, quite frankly. And we got it out the door, and I think you know it's been pretty successful. Uh, RNS and um, providing fabulous uh, imagery and, and climate information and, and so forth. And so I really enjoyed that part of my career working in the in the uh, atmospheric sciences. I did have a couple, I don't know, there's just, um, I actually put this together. It looks better up there than it does here, which is good. Uh, I put this together for a group uh, at the University of District Columbia that was interested in this kind of work too. And so, I don't know, kind of neat, neat pictures if you don't know much, but everybody knows about GOES, right? So. All right. All right. Why don't we skip this? <clears throat> Excuse me. It was just for kind of fun anyway. And if you'd put the other presentation back on for me, it'd be great. All right. So what I wanted to do is just kind of give you an overview. Uh, I won't get into a lot of gory detail. You can ask as many 
uh, of those kinds of questions, if you like. I don't know if it'll be as entertaining as the last couple times, but uh, uh, I'll try to do my best. Uh, but I did, um, I, I love opportunities to come and talk to groups of people about uh, ABET, the work we do, the value we provide, the impact I think we have, uh, especially around the world now, and I'll get to that uh, a little bit later. Uh, but, you know, I think um, from my perspective, I went to, uh, University got my undergraduate in electrical engineering and all that sort of thing. And at the time, I had no idea about a about what it meant that our program was accredited. It was, uh, but I didn't really understand the uh, the impact. And then, as I got further in my academic career and I became, uh, you know, an associate professor, uh, went through the process the first time myself. And that was my uh, first exposure to that when I was leading the computer engineering uh, review. Uh, hey, this was really good. The continuous improvement. I could see how it actually made a, a, a positive impact to our program, so I was, I was sold at that point. Uh, I have um, three sons, two of them are in engineering, uh, one's at Georgia Tech and one's at University of Maryland, and from that point of view, it was good that they're going to uh, accredited programs because we know what to expect from those programs and the standards that they, that they uh, uh, uphold to. Uh, as when I worked at, uh, at NASA, I was actually for a subcontractor, uh, Aerospace Corporation, we hired people, and from uh, an industry point of view, it was good to have that confidence that we're hiring people that knew what they were doing because we ran across several people <clears throat> in uh, different fields that were ABITs, uh, uh, accredit credits that they came from non-accredited programs and they really weren't what we thought they were. So I think that was a big eye-opener uh, as well. Anyway, um, let me just go ahead and get into some some um, kind of basics so we can get rid of any um, misnomers or uh, rumors and so forth. So what we say about ABIT accreditation, why we exist, the kind of work that we do, it's all about confidence. And you can always come back to that. And I kind of use that just as a little bit of an introduction with my, my children and, and hiring and so forth. But I think it makes a big difference. Um, certainly our employers, we have a lot of industry people that uh, list ABIT, uh, you know, graduation from an ABIT accredited program as one of the requirements before they even recruit because they want to know when they go hire, whether it's an engineer, a computer scientist, a health physicist, whatever it happens to be, that they have an understanding that there's a certain standard of uh, educational experience those students have gone through. So they have the confidence that, yeah, these students will have at least gone through that. And then, of course, they take the next step and you know, interview the individual and so forth. But nonetheless, uh, the program does meet a certain um, standard of um, expectations in terms of what should the students know and experience and you know, the kind of skills they ought to be able to demonstrate. We are a federation of societies, okay? So the way we're, we're a membership organization, but we don't have direct members. We have these, what we call our member societies, and they're professional technical societies. And the reason that we have these societies is because we look to them as the uh, representatives of the profession, okay? So I'm a member of IEEE, uh, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and uh, you know, they're big into standards and professional development, all kinds of things, but we look to them to provide the experts, the disciplinary experts, for us to then go off and do our reviews, which is how I got involved with ABET in the first place. And so if you look across here, there's um, all kinds of different ones, those involved in engineering and computing, uh, and some of the natural applied sciences and so forth, uh, construction management. Okay. Uh, very diverse, uh, much more diverse than it was just even maybe 15 or 20 years ago, or certainly when uh, Amanda started with ABET in 1980-something, 88. So <laughs> there's that. Uh, the way we're organized is this way, and I don't need to necessarily get into the details of this, but there's a, there's a point I did want to make about this. So we have a board of directors, right, um, as most organizations do, especially the nonprofits, of course. Uh, we have this other uh, representation of uh, what we call the board of delegates, which is our member society representations. We have our commissions, which, are, which does uh, our um, operational aspects of the reviews and make the decisions about accreditation actions. And then we have this small army of what we call program evaluators. And they number about 2,200, 2,000 to 2,200 individuals that go off and actually do our reviews. And each and every one of the people on each of these um, columns here come from the professional societies, okay? And that's what makes us unique, uh, especially when we go around the world, because we are purely peer review, all right? We get invited to come to programs, come in, review my program with the intent of being accredited, but also to provide me some value in terms of making my program better. What can you, what can you, what kind of advice can you give me, okay? So certainly, if you're an electrical engineering program or an atmospheric research or a sciences program, you want to have someone that knows something about your field to come in and do that, not just, for lack of a better word, some bureaucrat or somebody that's in a, you know, that kind of a role. So we are purely peer review. So we will guarantee, for example, that if we go visit 
a, a civil engineering program, a civil engineer will, will do that. Either someone from in, uh, industry, from some government agency, or from, uh, uh, from academe, one of the three, all right? So that's a key aspect, and I think that's one, of the, that's one of our strengths, quite frankly, is because we can lean on that. Very dedicated individuals, too. The decisions are not made by me <clears throat> or anybody on staff. So when an accreditation decision is made, it's made by the commissions. It's made by those representatives from the professional societies. They're the ones that uh, will look through the review, uh, uh, the reports, and so forth, uh, hear the uh, you know, discussion about individual programs and so forth. And they will be the ones that will make the final decision on accreditation. Okay? My job is just to keep the business going, make sure everything works. People you know, get plane tickets. They get paid to do whatever. You know get their travel paid and that type of thing. But the, the, the volunteers really do run ABET uh, from the top to bottom. Okay, so what are, what are we involved with? Well, we are involved with academic programs specifically, okay? Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the institutional accreditors, and they're looking at institutional-wide sort of issues. Uh, sometimes they dabble into other areas, but we are purely uh, a program uh, accreditor. Okay. And in the United States, there's about 60 of us. They're, they have one for business. Actually, they have two of them in business. Uh, they have them in pharmacology and nursing and architecture, and you know the list goes on and on. So we are focused primarily in engineering, computing, and applied natural sciences now. Right? We accredit at all three levels. And the theory there is, is we accredit what is the appropriate entry level into the profession. All right? Now, it turns out that most of those are going to be baccalaureate level programs because a student can go through a program in whatever, graduate with a four-year or five-year bachelor's degree or six-year bachelor's degree, however long it takes them, uh, and then go into whatever you know, profession that is. Okay? Sometimes it's not so straightforward. Sometimes it's at the master's level. Okay? Uh, perfect example is health physics, I think, uh, where they bring a lot of undergrads and then they have master's programs in health physics or uh, programs along those lines. And so that's the master's level accreditation. And then associates uh, and technicians. We do a lot of, uh, we credit a lot of programs that uh, graduate the students that go off and become technicians. So it really is um, determined by what is that entry level. These are the things we don't do, <clears throat> okay? So we do not accredit institutions, schools, colleges, degrees, graduates, and so forth, all right? There are mechanisms for certifying individuals through licensing and all that sort of thing, but we don't uh, actually do any of that work, okay? Now, it's common to people to say, oh yeah, it's an ABED accredited school or something, and I, I know what that means, but technically we're not, we're not, we're not involved in that. Okay, so here's some facts. Okay, we're non-governmental, and that's really important, especially when you go out in the world, because there's lots of ministries of education and so forth that, <clears throat> excuse me, want to apply pressure to institutions and so forth. And of course, we have some, need to have some independence and so forth, and we don't want to be uh, pressured because you know certain governments happen to be in power and so forth. And so, non-governmental is key. That way, we we can we can separate ourselves from any of those kind of political or other kinds of uh, decisions or pressures that might be, might be placed. I mentioned peer review uh, already. Uh, we're all about continuous improvement, all right? And uh, certainly as scientists, engineers, and so forth, people want to make things better. And this is what, this is our philosophy, is we want continuous improvement in everything that we see. So one of the criteria, which I'm not going to get into today, but one of the criteria is that you have a continuous improvement process in place. Right? Most programs probably do already in some fashion, but you know, we want, expect to see that because the whole idea is, as professional educators, right, you examine how well you're doing. Right? You take feedback from that in some fashion. Either things are working really well, let's keep doing that, more of that. Things maybe could be improved a little bit or a lot. And so you take that information, you feed it back into the next iteration, next semester, next cycle, whatever that is and then make things better. And so that's, that's the whole preface or for what we, we, we uh, like to see. Okay? Assessment, that's understanding what students are learning. All right? And that is so important because you know I taught, as um, Tony mentioned, uh, while in faculty, and I was a great lecturer. I'd stand up here, and I'd have my 50 minutes of lecture and so forth, and everybody would be out there. And quite frankly, I had no idea who was really getting it and who really wasn't getting it. Right. And you know the National Academy's grand challenges, for example, one of those one of them is individualized learning. So how do we how do we maximize learning in students? Well, you can't do that until you understand how they learn. Right? 
I was on a, a visit, an observation visit at um, in Kingston, Ontario, with Engineers Canada to Queen's University. All right, and Queen's University, what they do, and it was an engineering uh, review. What they do is they record all of their lectures. So any lecture in any course, whether it's your you know introductory mathematics, you know basic sciences, engineering, whatever, they record them all, and they make them available to the students anytime. So they record them, and then the students can watch them. All right. And I was in this room with about a dozen uh, students, and uh, so I asked the question, well, how do you like this? You know, Because it's nothing that I've really experienced. When I was an undergrad, they didn't record anything. It was just, you know, everything was live. But I asked the students, well, how do you like this? All right? And the first student said, uh, he said, oh, it's great. You know, and I never have to go to school anymore. I just stay home and I watch stuff on, on TV and I'm good. Okay? And then the woman next to her, I, or him, I said, well, how do you like it? And she said, well, I can't take notes when I go to lecture. So I go to the lecture live, and I sit there, and I just, I just stand, you know, I just sit there, and I listen to what the professor's saying. Okay. Then later, I watch the lecture, and that's when I take my notes. And I thought, wow, what a perfect example of two distinct learning styles, right? But you'd never know that if you didn't ask the question, and you'd probably never know that unless you really understood whether students are learning or not. So the assessment typically is the part of what we do which I think is probably the most important, yet is in many ways probably the one that people are not really most comfortable with. All right? Now, it turns out we have over 4,000 programs. People do this all the time. There's some really um, um, straightforward ways to assess you know, student performance and knowledge and so forth. Uh, we do training. We do free training. There's lots of information out there on the, on the web. We were one of the first organizations to really embrace this as a means to, um, you know, as part of our process. Now it's pretty much everywhere, right? The whole idea of outcomes-based education, defining outcomes and then assessing how students are, are doing. It's used um, certainly throughout the US and pretty much throughout the world now as the standard. So we have some, some good history with this and, and a lot of success. So nothing to worry about necessarily because, you know, again, there's plenty of examples of how uh, programs do it really well in all areas, not just engineering, but in all areas. Uh, and again, there's uh, plenty of uh, resources um, to, to help you in that area. Outcomes, um, you know, really, what's this, you know, what are students learning in, as opposed to how many credit hours of calculus did they take or whatever? That was the old way. <clears throat> and that is pretty much gone uh, from most um, all, uh, you know, contemporary, certainly accreditors that I'm, I'm familiar with. We don't, we don't worry too much about that anymore. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing we get, um, uh, some pushback on every once in a while is, hey, you know, if I'd like to do something different at my institution, but ABET won't let me, and I'm worried about losing my accreditation. Well, I can tell you that <clears throat> that could be farther from the truth, all right? Uh, again, I'm not going to get into the criteria because I don't really have the time. I don't think it's necessary now. But if you go look at the criteria, you'll see it, you know, if you read it, and it's like it pretty much lets you do what you want as long as you achieve certain standards, all right? If you think about engineering, that's my field. I mean, there's all inst you know, institutions are doing amazing things, you know, project-based learning to you know, flip classrooms, all this kind of thing. We don't, we don't dictate any of that. Okay? We just want to make sure that when students graduate from your programs, they have a certain ability to you know, set up and conduct experiments, you know, collect data, you know, be able to communicate, and you know, solve engineering problems in the engineering world and that type of thing. So pretty much that. So I, I think we do a really good job of uh, encouraging innovation. I think you see it. I mean, you do see it. It's, it's everywhere in, in our higher education. This is key. The professional societies okay, and industry have an opportunity to have direct impact, right? Because our program criteria come from the societies. That's where it comes from, okay? It doesn't come from me in my office. It comes through um, you know, collective work by our criteria committees and the different commissions that are populated from our uh, member societies. So if AMS, for example, were the uh, uh, member society that was involved in atmospheric sciences, they would be the ones through you and your members to determine, okay, what should a student be able to do when they graduate from school, you know, for your program? And along the way, what should they be able to do? So that's um, critical. Uh, I like to put industry in there because uh, we're unique in the world <clears throat> in the sense that we have very strong industry support. Okay, we were actually founded by industry. That's how AVA came to be in the first place. And through our history, we've had strong support both at the, uh, at the organizational level as well as at the institutions. And around the world, which I'll talk about here in just a minute, and some of our partners, that doesn't exist. And I think um, in many ways they're quite envious because industry has that. I mean, they're ultimate customers in many instances, right? So you want them to help you define what things look like. Over 100,000 graduates each year come out of programs accredited by us. And that's actually, uh, 
about a six-year-old number. It's probably more like 130 by now because we've grown pretty steadily. Uh, so that's a, lot of, that's a lot of graduates, a lot of people that benefit from what we do. So over our history, many millions of students have gone through that. Uh, and then the processes, uh, we, we have our own processes are certified. Okay? And I think that's really important for two reasons. One is, I think for, as from a leadership point of view, we expect you to have a continuous improvement process in your institution, then we ought to be able to do the same thing. Plus, it makes us better just does it makes us better what we do it helps us quickly highlight things that maybe aren't working so well that we can fix right and it reinforces practices that work well so we um, and we're one of the only accreditors certainly in the United States and in other words maybe only two or three that, uh, that have achieved ISO certification so we're quite proud of that and uh, you know very strong believers in in the whole idea of continuous improvement what does that mean? ISO the ISO part so the International Standards Organization, <clears throat> okay, it's very common, like for example, as a consumer, you won't, many people won't buy appliances if they don't come out of factories that are ISO certified and car, you know, car manufacturers and all that kind of thing. But it's a pretty um, uh, thorough process where um, you define your processes, you, ha you have audits, external audits, we have them uh, every other year. Teams come in and audit us. Are we following our processes? Are they documented? How do we know? Are we making, um, uh, are we taking action? On, on areas where we need improvement and that type of thing. And we pay for this, of course. You know, we invite the auditors to come in and do this sort of thing. So it's a uh, pretty much an internationally recognized standard for um, continuous improvement. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. <clears throat> All right, so why do we care about accreditation? Well, again, I, really, I go back to this idea of what do students need to do when they enter the profession. I had a conversation some years ago with one of the other basic sciences, uh, or one of the other um, natural sciences, rather, and uh, they were describing to me how they had programs in, from all different kinds of colleges, but their students' experiences were all over the place. And so this one government employer, the uh, USGS, Geological Survey, I guess, they said they have to run their students through, the graduates through a boot camp when they come in because they, they have no sense for what did the students learn and how much of this and so forth. You know, they have track records certainly with individual schools, but on, on, the, on the whole, the students weren't at the same level. So having certain standards is important for that. Uh, certainly, institutions demonstrate they're committed to improvement, otherwise they wouldn't go through this process because there's an investment. There's an investment especially in time and resources, and personnel, and so forth, all right? So to formalize things, so there's certainly an, a, a, a demonstration from the institution of the commitment. Lots of value, I mentioned this a little bit in my opening, but certainly students, especially now when there's, they, they have so many options for education, right? Uh, certainly traditional uh, brick and mortar kind of institutions, but there's lots of online and, and, and distance learning available. How do they sort through who's who and what is legitimate and what will pay off? Because they can all pay lots of money for tuition and fees, but at the end of the day when they graduate, are they going to get something that's worthwhile? And I'm sure many of you have your own experiences with students coming from maybe different schools and so forth. And good, Are they good? Are they not good? Did they really get good experience didn't they and unfortunately the students don't know when they get in I mean they just don't know again the institutions the the quality improvement helps a lot <clears throat> usually when we um, when I talk to academic audiences the deans are all yeah this is great stuff and the department chairs and the faculty are like eh, not so much because it requires a bit more work on my part but I think on, on, the, on the in the big scheme of things I think uh, the institutions really uh, really appreciate the uh, the ability to implement something that is going to help them get better uh, and so uh, certainly institutions uh, evaluate faculty, industry, and then general public because they ultimately um, you know, benefit from having well-educated people going off and designing whatever uh, they're designing. All right, let me just talk about global engagement. Um, I think we have a big impact on making the world a better place. Okay? I think that every day. Uh, and I see it, uh, certainly increasing the quality of STEM education is part of that, right? There's huge problems in the world. We all know this, right? I mean, you guys studied the atmosphere, you know this. And I actually, I just came back from, uh, I flew from Berlin just last week and I flew over Greenland and then you could, and the clouds weren't over it, which was kind of interesting because usually the last couple times I've been there, it's been cloudy, but you could see, you know, just these vast lakes and I gotta believe all these, you know, glaciers melting and so forth. But we know that there's huge problems and they're not gonna get fixed because we want them to get fixed. They're going to get fixed because we need to not only educate students to understand how to solve these problems, but get them committed to doing it and, you know, get them energized about doing it. And uh, education is the way, okay? Uh, this is a great way for us to um, expand our influence globally. 
from the from the professional society perspective, and that happens all the time because they're out there setting the standards around the world, okay? even if they don't have a direct, uh, you know, uh, direct um, membership from outside the U.S. And then our team chairs and program evaluators, who I'll talk about shortly, um, globalizing, and they love doing the international work because it's fascinating to go to different countries and see how they're educating their students. What are they experiencing? How are their programs constructed? What are their challenges? This, we need more evaluators because of our growth, but I can tell you that we rarely lose them because they find it such a fascinating professional development opportunity, unique among uh, many. All right, sustainable development goals, you probably know about this, but I like to use this as a way to talk about the impact we have because I can talk about all the nuts and bolts of accreditation and you guys will be asleep in about 30 minutes, right? But if you talk about the big picture and why it makes a difference, I think that's really important part, all right? You can look at any of these uh, goals and it doesn't take a whole lot of dots to connect where we all have an impact on them, okay? But getting the students thinking about them in a way that they can actually go off and do something I, th I think is important. We're, we're, we're busy in India and we have lots of, uh, we actually have a staff person that works there. Uh, there's more and more interest all the time uh, from Indian institutions to become accredited. I want to do that because uh, in that part of the world especially, they have a lot of pressing um, you know, um, problems that affect their everyday lives. Right? 2020, 21 of their largest metropolitan areas have run, will have run out of water, okay, that's only 18 months or less than 18 months, we're gonna run out of water. All right, that's a big deal, right? The pollution, you know, it, depending upon what time of year you go there, the air can be toxic, literally. They lose like two and a half million of their citizens die every year from air pollution. I mean, two and a half million people, that's huge, right? So anyway, getting students to understand that, you know, they have an obligation and an opportunity. I use this example, I'm an IEEE member, okay? And so I put, pulled their annual report last year and this is the reason I put it up there. You can see the quote from the opening paragraph from the current president's statement it says, hey, as engineers and scientists and educators, we have a commitment to make the world better, okay? She couldn't have said it any better, right? And so sure, IEEE is full of high tech, this and that and the other thing, but when it comes to the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is what we care about, all right? And so I think talking in those terms um, helps because it, it makes a difference. All right, globally, we have lots of partnerships and so forth, um, formal agreements, lots of accrediting agencies like ourselves in different areas, and you can see them in engineering, computing, and so forth. We do accredit programs outside the US, uh, lots of them actually now. Uh, and we're also engaged globally, so becoming part of uh, us in terms of you know, influence in education has a global uh, impact, and that is uh, only going to continue to increase. Right now, when I joined ABET in 2009 on staff, we just started accrediting international programs. Okay, so we just started. Now we have, what does that number say? Over, um, yeah, almost 800 programs. That's huge. Considering we were founded in 1932, and when I joined ABET in, in 2009, we had 2,700 programs. Now we have over 4,000 programs. So we've been growing at a really significant rate, right? And the growth's been, a lot of it's been international, but a lot of it's been expanding disciplines, okay, in the applied sciences specifically, but in others. Right. And I think that's a good um, uh, testament to the value that these institutions and programs realize by going through the kind of work, you know, the kind of processes uh, that we um, promote. And so this is um, growing and it will continue to grow. Right? And I feel very satisfied, not just because, hey, business is good, but our impact is getting greater and greater. Our influence is getting greater and greater. Our leadership is growing. Right? And so all those things uh, are very positive. We collaborate with lots of, directly with lots of international organizations, and these are all focused on engineering or STEM education in some way. You know, we don't just accredit programs, but you have to be part of the conversations. You have to help influence, you know, be part of uh, people's um, discussions. Uh, you want to share good examples. It turns out that uh, in the Washington Accord and Agreement of Accreditors, there's 20 of us. Ten of them basically mimicked exactly our processes and criteria, and they tweaked them a little bit for their individual countries and so forth, but they just lifted them, and quite frankly, we were quite happy about that because they said, hey, why go back and reinvent the wheel? Let's just take what works and implement that on a global scale. And so now, you know, our influence, those 4,000 programs is impressive, but if you look across the board internationally, how we've had an impact, it's many, many, multiple times that. Okay, so competencies, uh, I just wanna talk about this and I'll wrap up. Um, again, you know, I don't invent uh, what criteria and so thing, uh, things look like back in, in my office. I don't determine what students 
uh, should experience, what they should go through and, and understand. It's our professional technical societies. They're the ones that develop the criteria. They're the ones that determine what students got to go through and what they should experience. All right. Uh, and it's got to be contemporary. We, we update our criteria from time to time to make sure we're keeping up to speed with what's going on in the world of education. Whoops, I'm sorry. And then, um, you know, again, for the profession, it helps promote this uh, whole idea of standard of practice, right? But again, there's lots of flexibility built in, so programs can be different, okay? Diversity is a great thing. That's one of the strengths of the American educational system. Yeah. Quick story, we went to Russia, and we have a couple programs in Russia, and we had a gr group like this, and they're all engineering uh, professors from different institutions. They said, why don't you just tell us what to do, and we'll all do the same thing, okay? But that's not what we want. We want programs to be different, of course, because that's where you get the power is, is through diversity and diversity of thought. So um, Russian programs are great. I'm not... It was just an example, you know, in the discussion, but it's that kind of approach. We want diversity. Okay, lots of different, you don't see um, too much engineering up here, or do you see any engineering? You don't. Okay, so these are areas that we've, uh, that we're active in now, okay, and, and is growing, and you'll see um, ones up there that uh, may or may not be familiar with you, but uh, the whole idea of, of, of formal quality assurance is the key thing here. So setting up formal quality processes, checking, seeing how well you're doing, you know, making adjustments to your program, you know, the outside, the third party validation of that is what's important. That's what's important. Okay, real quickly, what do we do? Well, it's voluntary, it's fair and impartial. You know, we do uh, about 900 visits a year, between seven and 900 visits. And we went through, until just recently, we had 17 years without a single um, protest to, a, to an actual finding, okay? And the reason for that is because I think we do such a good job of uh, quality control. So that's many, many thousands of programs uh, without a, without a, uh, a formal um, uh, challenge. We do, you know, you do self-assessment and programs really benefit from that. Uh, we typically work on a six-year cycle, okay? Uh, and the key thing is it's all pretty much pass-fail. So the, whatever the criteria are, you need to pass them or you, uh, you know, you miss one, you, you don't, you're not, you're not in good shape. Uh, there's, you can't, you know, do really well on one and not well on the other, okay? And when you look at the criteria, you'll see what they are, and it's all straightforward. You say, yeah, of course we should be advising students, right? Of course we should be doing that. Of course we should be doing this. Of course you, you know. It's, it's, it's quite, um, I think it's quite straightforward. Okay, we like evidence. You know, I'll just put this up there. Um, evidence is important. You're all scientists. You like data, right? You want to make informed decisions. So you're going to have to get data somehow, <clears throat> and you're going to have to show and share with our evaluators, hey, you know, we think the students did really well, or they really understood this, or they didn't understand this, you know, and here's the changes we made, and why did you, and how did you come to those decisions, right? And so the evidence is what you want. It's not about test taking, you know, there's plenty of examples of really brilliant people that just don't do well on tests for whatever reason, pressure, you know, whatever, but you know, there's much more to it than that, and that's where this last bullet about this idea of assessment and assessing student learning. All right, so uh, what else do you do? We come and visit, you do a self-study, and then we publish uh, the updated list every October. So this week, actually, uh, we're putting up our new programs. Um, again, we're all about improving, so that's what you want to use the data for, is to improve the educational experience that uh, your students go through. Okay, so who are these people that come and visit my program? Okay, these are gonna be people that are gonna be like you, okay? They're gonna be people in your same profession, in your same discipline areas, all right? You may, uh, you generally, well, you may know them, but generally not, because we have a fairly strict conflict of interest policy. So if you graduated from an institution, we're not gonna send you back there. If you have children that are in that inst program, we're not gonna send you there because very well, there may be no conflict, but there could be a perceived conflict. So let's not worry about uh, getting getting there. So anyway, but these people come from uh, your profession and are assigned by your uh, uh, professional societies. ABET doesn't do the assignment, it's the professional societies that do that. We train them and we retrain them and then we retrain them more because we found that uh, in order to get the level of quality and consistency to where it needs to be so that everybody gets, you know, we do 900 programs, they can't be all over the place, you have to have some level of consistency. The first thing you want to do is train people really well so that they're comfortable. And going back to this idea of confidence, you want them to come in confident that they have the tools that they need to do a good, fair, and valuable review. Because again, you're inviting us in, you're paying for us to be there, you deserve a good review and you deserve to, 
gain some value from it. So pure and simple, we take the training very seriously. Uh, we do lots of face-to-face -face training, web-based training, and so forth. All right, self-study is pretty straightforward, but uh, again, it's um, it just tells us how you're doing as a program. And the, the uh, very valuable thing about the self-study is when programs finish that, they're like, ah, we should have, you know, here's something we should do or here's a real strength that we should maximize on, or here's some shortcoming or whatnot. But typically the whole self-study process, just doing the self-evaluation, which we do through ISO too, by the way, is something that really highlights what's, you know, what you can do uh, to be better. And I can guarantee you there are no perfect programs anywhere. Of those 4,005, there are no perfect ones. Everyone can get better. And then we tell you how to, I mean, we give you guidance. We don't just, you know, let it cut you loose. There's templates and so you can, we, we guide you along the way. Okay, real quickly, here's what a team looks like. We have program evaluators, we have team chairs, and we have multiple team chairs, we have editors. There's actually, I think this next one, I'm sorry. We have a, a series of um, people that do the consistency checking, so before you get a final review or a final action, you'll, it'll have been looked at by many people so that we're making sure we're getting things right. Uh, so you know what we expect. It's basically a three-day visit. We show up on Sunday. Okay, we go and talk, look at facilities, talk with faculty, talk to students, look at evidence. We leave Tuesday, and Tuesday afternoon is when we do our final exit statement. We'll tell you what our initial recommendations are with respect to the accreditation actions, but they're not finalized for several months afterwards because there's a back and forth. Maybe there's some error, uh, uh, you know, facts, uh, or we need some clarification on something along those lines. So um, that's how that works. Uh, that was my exit. And then, um, you know, the whole idea of us showing up there is just a verification. If you think about it, you're doing your continuous improvement always. That's something that's forever. I mean, you're just doing it. And then we come every six years for three days just to say, yep, you're doing it. You're doing it well. Or maybe you could do some improvement or whatnot. So what we're really doing is verifying your quality. You're the ones building in the quality. It's not us. We're the ones just coming to check and say, okay, we're the third party that's saying, yes, they have a quality program. Yes, the students are achieving whatever they're achieving uh, and so forth. All right. This is a two year, so there's year one and the year two, okay, to give you an idea on the time, okay? Now, before you get um, too nervous, this isn't all you. There's different colors here, and I think the purple is what the stu uh, institutions are doing, right? And then the orange is what we're doing, and then the yellow is what we do together. But basically what you do is you have your program running, uh, you're going to prepare, you're going to apply, then you're going to prepare your self-study, you're going to give it to us, we're going to come visit, and then there might be some back and forth about certain aspects of the program, or maybe some facts that we need clarification on. Uh, we send you some draft statements, you either say, yeah, that sounds good, or like, hey, we don't like this, we think this is wrong, you send it back to us, we work through that process, back and forth, and then uh, the July of the second year is when the commissions make their decisions, and then October again is when they get published, okay? Looks like a long amount of, uh, amount of time, but it's in there for a reason. Uh, we do a lot of quality control in these areas to make sure that the uh, findings are accurate, correct, and fair. Because with 900 programs, again, we could have a finding at Southwest whatever state university and another one, you know, somewhere halfway around the world, they need to have consistent findings based on the evidence that's provided. Okay. Now, with 2,000 evaluators, you know, this is a human process, so we do a really good job of training but I can't, I won't guarantee you 100% of the people are going to be excellent, right? I mean, it's just, it's a human process, right? So we want to make sure that we take any ambiguity out of that or as much as we can. So we spend a lot of time doing consistency checking to make sure that you get the very best and fair evaluation. Right? And it, it's real. Here's the consistency check. So this is for engineering. I just put, because I do a lot of uh, talks to engineering groups. But the team, before they leave campus, they all have to agree on the findings. So let's pretend like it's, it's not uncommon for us to have eight or 10 programs at an institution, right? If one program evaluator from, I don't know, electrical engineering says, hey, thumbs down on this program because I don't like this, the other teammates have to agree that that's a legitimate finding. If they say, hey, defend that, defend that action, defend that your recommendation, okay? If they can't defend it, they won't leave campus until they have agreement on it. So the first level is at the team, okay? And you, you pretty much get rid of all anything that's not, uh, not consistent there. And then the, between the teams, the team chairs do it. And then we have this thing called the editing chain where we have individuals, people that have a lot of experience reviewing the findings, not just amongst teams, but across teams and then even farther, all right? So five levels pretty much, uh, and including our staff. So by the time that the recommendations come forward in July at our summer meetings, we have a really good idea what it looks like. Okay. The other thing is, if we go to a program and they, we go through the review and it turns out that there, there's no way they're going to be successful, 
This is voluntary. Programs always have the option to pull their application at any point in time, right? So if there's something that's significantly wrong and they're not going to be successful, they can pull it and there's no harm, no foul, okay? And that is generally a good thing because it allows them to kind of regroup and, you know, prepare for the next um, iteration if they want, right? So it's not all or anything. There's always the opportunity to do that. Okay, so I, I'm finished with my part. Uh, I don't know if you want to do questions now or have Amanda go and then do questions or whatever you'd like to do. All right, so good question. Okay, so I, I always like to talk about costs in two different ways. So the, straight up, if you go to our website, it has all the fees, but it's a little over 3000 a program, I think. Something like that, okay? So when we come to visit, you basically pay an evaluator. And what that pays for is for them to come. It pays for their travel, their food. You don't get, you know, billed for that, right? It's just a flat rate, right? Now, in between visits, we have a maintenance fee, which is a few hundred dollars that you pay to keep your program current, all right? And the next time you visit, we do that. We've helped, helped, pretty much kept our fees constant since I've been in, in, in where we are now because, you know, for obvious reasons, we can't get too crazy. But it's, it's that. Now, the other part of the cost, of course, is how do you, your resources back at your university, right? And are you going to send your people for training? You know, are you going to do whatever? And uh, so there is that. Uh, and it's mostly time more than anything. But uh, I can tell you from personal experience when I was at the Air Force Academy and went through this process, once you get your things set up, it's pretty much, it's, I mean, you just kind of just follow your process and it goes, you know. And um, that's the best part of it because then when things appear that aren't working or are working, like, hey, I need to add students for whatever reason aren't getting this concept. Should we add another laboratory, another exercise, change textbooks, whatever? You can make more informed decisions based on the data that you're seeing. So anyway, yes? Correct. All right, I'm going to have to check if I can pull back. Well, okay. Where's back home, first of all? Uh, South Dakota School Marks. Oh, yeah, okay, so that's right. No, 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 okay, hold on, time out. <laughs> Let me just qualify that. It's 3,000 per individual. So here's, here's the thing. We charge, uh, okay, bear with me, right? So um, if you, okay, let's, let's use a team of five people, okay? Or, or we, can, we come with five program evaluators. We'll charge 3,000 per program, so that's 15,000, right? And then we have to pay for the team chair, so we also bill 3000 for the team chair. Okay? Now, if you have a single program, okay, then um, we end up having sending two program evaluators because part of the consistency part is to make sure that that person has someone to talk to and can uh, negotiate um, findings and so forth. So that's the, that's the, we bill per person, so that would be uh, $6,000. Well, they're evaluated separately because they are different programs. If you have combined, you know, we have some integrated programs, and that's a different thing. But um, it depends if they're separate or whether they're integrated. Wait, it's 3,000 per individual person or per individual program? Well, we say person because generally when we go, um, what we what we do is that first quality control check I showed about the teams, right? The team members, where they get together and they have to make team decisions before they leave. We have to have a team, so we define a team as by as least two people, right? So uh, that's why we have uh, we charge by the person because we have to send two people, right? That would nine thousand dollars, correct? Well, I'm not going to get into that. I don't. I mean, I, 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 I'm just trying to. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, not so much Bean County, but okay.
Well, you do sort of in a sense that if you have uh, several programs, then the cost per program goes down because you spread the cost over more programs, right? Yeah. But can you actually do a natural science? What natural science program, say five engineering programs concurrently and not expect them? Well, the thing is, is the commission, yeah. Well, I, the problem is, is I don't know that an electrical engineer wouldn't understand about enough about meteorology. We wouldn't team them that way. Did you want to? No, we wouldn't. I mean, we wouldn't team them that way. Well, I'm sorry, which school is he at? Uh, school of Mines. Is South Dakota, do you say? Or South Dakota School of Mines. Yeah. They'll be separate because it's a different commission. Yeah. So it's a completely different commission. We, there are a couple exceptions, but not in your area. Like in the computing engineering, we do some joint ones, you know, because there's some engineering and computing science joint programs. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's different. Yeah, applied yeah. natural science is exactly right. Yep. Can, can I just say one thing about this? Mm -hmm. This is an issue continually in our commission, in the Applied and Natural Science Commission, because we're a small commission. I mean, we're, the commission, the programs are all small that are in our commission. Most of them are small. And they are constantly dealing with this issue of the cost. So one of the things that we came up with, not for initial accreditation, but ongoing, <clears throat> we did a pilot called a partially virtual visit. Right. Mm -hmm. where we send just the team chair to campus and the program evaluators do it virtually. And so we have been doing that now for about four years and our commission's the only one that does that because we have a lot of single program. Mm -hmm. So it reviews. may be that after you did your initial accreditation, if you got, you know, if you got a next general review or a, uh, or you had one weekend and you resolved it before, then we would then offer you the right to do a partially virtual visit, which means you'd only pay the team chair. Three thousand two hundred fifty for the team chair to come to your campus. You know. Instead of the no, 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 no. You don't pay for that. No, no. They shouldn't be paying on area. No. Got to look into that if they are. No, no, no. Seriously, there's no. Um, no, it's a flat fee. It's a flat fee, and it pays for. Uh, uh, pays for hotel, travel. Uh, there's. We don't pay uh, any of the evaluators on our area. Right, the team, the team sends their bills, their, their travel expenses to ABET, and yeah. ABET pays them. Yeah, there's no, now the thing is, you know, cost is an issue everywhere. I, I understand that, I, I, and I'm not trying to um, make it s sound like it's not a, an issue, because it certainly is. Our academic, we have an academic advisory council that advises the board of directors, and it's made up of about 20 institutions, and those institutions reflect our member, our, our inst, you know, the programs that we accredit. So yes, we have a Georgia Tech, and Carnegie Mellon sits on there, but we have others as well. We have community colleges that sit on that board, or on that council, and others, because we need, you know, and they've been quite instrumental, actually, in, in kind of giving us guidance on how to make the visits less um, busy. You know, for example, uh, it used to be that we would uh, spend a lot of time expecting uh, programs to develop or, or to make all kinds of display materials available for the reviews. And it turns out that, well, maybe it wasn't that valuable after all. So what we've gone to is we've, we've trimmed that down, okay? Uh, this is this next cycle. Trimmed it down to where the only the recommendation from them was to only demonstrate, only provide materials that demonstrate the achievement of the outcomes. You didn't have to have every textbook for every course that's in your program and all those kinds of things. But what is focused on? Oops, sorry, what is focused on achieving the um, the uh, you know demonstrating the outcomes? A through K, but it'll be one through seven. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you know we we're. It's not us versus you. I mean, we want to work. This is, I mean, 75% of our evaluators are all from academia anyway. So, I mean, we're all in this together. So we want to make it work exactly right. So, uh, but that's a good point. You know, the virtual visits is something that we've used in certain other instances. But it's something that I think we're going to look at a lot more closely because if we can, especially in their instance where you go through initial review and we're like, yeah, we're happy with that program. We think it's really strong. The next cycle we can go back and maybe do uh, something where that's not as um, intense in terms of people and not as expensive and maybe make it uh, less. And, and they've had a number of programs where they've done that. So we're, we're trying to work. Absolutely trying to work. And by the way, you can see the fee schedule. If you go to our website under new accreditation, there's a tab there. You can go down to the fees are there. Absolutely they're there. Sir. So uh, this question uh, is probably more directed at the United States. 
So this, uh, the idea of fees brings up a question that is perhaps maybe not directed specifically at you all and at ABET, but more at the Board of Higher Education and the community that's here, in that we have UCAR, which all of us, I believe, are a part of, that has a membership fee associated with it and a review process that happens on an eight-year cycle uh, mm -hmm. associated with that. And so I'm kind of curious, they are two separate uh, organizations, they are two separate processes, but is there any perception on the board's uh, view of overlap between these two processes? Should there be overlap? Knowing that, like for myself, I, my institution's up for renewal now, I have to go figure out how to get $3,500 from them, mm -hmm. and then another 6000 if we were to do something like this, and these would be continual cycles. And they don't seem like they should be a lot, but I've had problems getting hundreds of dollars, yet alone thousands of dollars, so. As the historian here, I can, I can relate that when we've discussed this in the past, one of the arguments was, well, wait a minute, we're all members of UCAR, and that there's a certain standard there. You have to apply to be in UCAR. You have to pay some money to be in UCAR. Well, if you're in UCAR, it's good enough. We don't need this. Who's ever been turned down for a UCAR membership? Who's ever been turned down for a renewal? Why do we even do a renewal? I think the renewal, Danny told me that re the renewal has gotten down to be fairly simple now, uh, that everyone gets renewed. One of the things here is this is a high stakes deal. If you don't meet the, the criteria, you get a deficiency in the criteria, you don't get accredited. And you come around the next time and you, they find a dis deficiency, the engineers that I work with, they're terrified they get a deficiency. They're terrified they get a weakness because if they get identified with a weakness, ABET's gonna come back and say, have you rectified the weakness? And if you lose your accreditation, their students are almost unemployable. Who's going to pay? That's an that's a administrative level decision. Now, if your institution focuses on accreditation, or some institutions do, uh, they'll find the money for it. If, you're, if your administration doesn't value it, they're not going to pay for it. Well, I don't know how many of us are going to go beg to get accredited. The question in my mind is, when you come to your dean and say, accreditation is available in my discipline, what is the dean going to say? Is he gonna say, I don't care? It's possible. Is the dean gonna say, wait, I saw that ABET accredits atmospheric science programs. You will get yours accredited. Is that the way it's gonna work? I don't know. I think at my place, I know how it's gonna work. As soon as my dean finds out this is available, it's gonna be, you will get it. It's gonna come out of his budget somewhere in academic affairs, I don't know. It's not going to come out of my budget. You're not going to see a drop from the other No. That's not the way it works for the engineers. Not at my place. Well, the engineers also Yours. Yeah. So if it you is. have engineering programs at your institutions, you're actually, that's a real good thing because then they know how to do it and you can benefit from that. We're in danger of running overtime, and we have one more presentation, and so if we can, why don't we move on to the second presentation, which I think may have additional information that would be useful for us to discuss. I'm so, happy to be here as long as you like, so whatever you want to do. Thank you, Dr. Milligan. Okay. Okay. One quick question then. Uh, since you're, we're opening the possibility of atmospheric science, has this been done with any of the atmospheric science societies in other parts of the world, Europe or Asia? Uh, well, not with us. Okay. Now, I can't speak to, I think there's something about the Canadians, you had mentioned about the Canadians doing that. I know our partners, Engineers Canada has, and it would have been a different organization, but um, I'm not aware of that. But quite frankly, I haven't really investigated that in a lot of detail. So it could very well be, but I'm not aware of it. Sorry. All right, let's move along. Our second speaker this afternoon is Amanda Reed. Also, I wanted to ask people, uh, PowerPoints and also it gives us um, your information if you're interested. We will post the PowerPoints. Oh, but anyway, if, if you pass that around, if people are interested in giving us your contact information, that would be great. Start that here. Uh, Amanda's official title is something like adjunct. <laughs> Right, director. I'm the adjunct accreditation director for applied natural science, and I'm here uh, supporting Dr. Milligan because I deal directly with the commission that would cover your programs. 
And so what I want to talk about very briefly is um, the general criteria, just so you know what it is we're talking about. The way that ABET works is each one of the commissions has its own general criteria, although some of them are harmonized, so they're the same across the commissions. But then if there is a society that's taking curricular responsibility as a member of ABET, they can write the program criteria, which is made up of additional faculty requirements if they have them, and additional curriculum requirements. So that's where the societies then put what in their body of knowledge they want to require that the students be exposed to in the programs. So uh, obviously your area doesn't have program criteria because AMS is not a member of ABAD, has not taken curricular responsibility, but the, under the general criteria, you could go ahead and submit your programs under the general criteria. We do a credit under the general criteria, and right now we are, um, we're, we've moved into natural science and we are accrediting natural science programs with the idea that eventually you're going to end up with the society that's going to take curricular responsibility, write the program criteria, and go from there. Uh, so this is, so I just want to do a very quick run through on the general criteria so you know what they are and what it is that we're dealing with. And many of you who are familiar with the engineering, just one thing to know is that we just changed Criterion 3, which is student outcomes, so there's no longer any A through K. It's now for 1 through 7 for engineering, it's 1 through 6 for ANSAC, so you'll see that in here, which basically just consolidated a lot of it. It's not terribly yeah, different. Is that now, is that now on the yeah, you can see that. There's a mapping, just so you know. There's a mapping on our website showing this very thing. Yeah. If you look at the criteria that's up on the website, if you go to the end of it for the proposed, which would which which is now in effect for the next, cycle. Effect for the next cycle for EAC. And for us it's going to be in effect also. So you don't have to worry about the A through K, you deal with the one through six or the one through seven, depending on what kind of program you are. Okay, so again, um, I'm you know it's it's outcomes based assessment, continuous improvement. We added our own definitions for, for these things so it would be clear to anybody what we're talking about in ANSAC when we talk about college level mathematics, natural science, and applied science. So the definitions are there. And I'm not going to go through them, but you can see what it is that we're talking about. Um, okay, so the general criteria, there's eight of them. Students, program educational objectives, student outcomes, continuous improvement, curriculum, faculty, facilities, and institutional support. And then after that is the program criteria. So students, so what we're really dealing with is, you know, um, to determine the success, the institution must evaluate, advise, and monitor students. And this becomes an issue in a number of our visits because they're not, they're not, they're not evaluating monitoring enough so that they're not making them take the courses in the correct sequences. So you end up with them out of sequence with no documentation showing why they gave them a waiver, and that becomes an issue. Um, policies and procedures for acceptance of transfer students, they look at that. Assurance that all students meet pr all program graduation requirements. So they look at the transcripts and they look at the materials when they go do the visits. All right, cr criterion two, and again, the thing about ABET and the outcomes-based assessment is it's a model that really works with all different kinds of institutions because under the outcomes-based assessment, you're no longer just bean counting, you're, you're dealing, it's not prescriptive, it's really dealing with, okay, you tell us what your institution is and what your mission is, and then how do you tie that to your program educational objectives of what you want your students to be able to accomplish a few years out from graduation, and then you tie that to your student outcomes, which, so, you could have a, a you know you could have an institution which was a religious institution and their mission has to do you know it ties into their religion and their program educational objectives reflect that and that's fine they're publishing that on their website they're saying this is who we are and this is what we're offering and students are selecting that and we're not telling them what they're going to do you know, so you can have everything from, you know, we were talking today in the earlier sessions, the R1, you know, Research One universities versus the, you know, universities that strictly do the teaching or variations. They all fit under this because you're, you're telling them, you tell us, who are you, what's your mission, what do you want your students to accomplish, how are you assessing that, how are you pulsing your stakeholders to make sure it's relevant to what you're doing. 
And then how does that then tie in with your student outcomes? Okay, so they have to be consistent with the mission and there must be a documented and effective process. And again, this is like what Dr. Milligan was talking about with ISO 9001. Big sticklers on you have to have it in writing. You could have great, you know, assessment processes. You could have great, you know, review of your program educational objectives. But if you don't have them written and you're not keeping minutes of those meetings, you're going to you're going to hear about it, and that that becomes basis for weaknesses. Okay, so then criterion three, which is really one of the fundamental points with regards to ABET accreditation under outcomes-based assessment is where it lays out, in our case, the one through six for the baccalaureate level. The program must have documented student outcomes that prepare graduates to attain the program educational objectives. There must be a documented and effective process for periodic review and revision. And so then the six of them for the baccalaureate are an ability to identify, formulate, and solve broadly defined technical or scientific problems by applying knowledge of mathematics and science and or technical topics to areas relevant to the discipline. And there's, a, there's an interconnection with the program criteria because on the program criteria, the, the society may have said, okay, for this program criteria, you have to have these curricular components. Well, because that's curriculum, that in itself doesn't have to be assessed. However, if you use those program criteria the curricular components to meet your student outcomes, which generally they do, because you're talking about identify, formulate, and solve broadly defined technical science, scientific problems, and then it's talking about technical topics. You're going to use those in order to show that. So they all, it all ties in. Okay. Uh, an ability to formulate or design a system, process, procedure, or program to meet the desired needs, an ability to develop and conduct experiments or test hypotheses and uh, analyze and interpret data, and use scientific judgment to draw conclusions, an ability to communicate effectively with a range of audiences, an ability to understand ethical and professional responsibilities and the impact of technical and or scientific solutions uh, in global economic, environmental, and societal contexts, and an ability to function effectively on teams that establish goals, plan tasks, meet deadlines, and analyze risk and uncertainty. And again, these things, you have to, what you have to do is go and map from your program to where you meet these. This doesn't mean you have to have a course in each one of these. It means you have to show that the content of that is somewhere in your curriculum so that students are getting that in some way. And it may be through, you know, Courses. It may be through internships. It may be through projects. Uh, it could be all kinds of things, but you just have to be able to show it. And then again, the continuous improvement. The continuous improvement deals with the student outcomes, not the program educational objectives. We changed that a number of years ago after a lot of feedback from our constituents that it was really the heart of it was the student outcomes. And so that's what we do this assessment. You have to show that you are assessing it that you are then taking that and going back and evaluating it with your stakeholders and that you're closing the loop. Now that doesn't mean you have to keep changing your curriculum, but you have to show you're going through a pro process. You may at the end of that process say, we're good, we don't need to change anything. That's fine, but you've gone through a documented process to show where you're at and what you're doing. Um, and then curriculum, uh, again, the thing is that the curriculum You've got to show subject areas appropriate to apply to natural science programs. So again, that goes back into if it's an atmospheric science program, you're going to have a curriculum that's appropriate to that. And then you have to have a combination of college level mathematics and sciences with the pro which are appropriate to the discipline. And you'll note in all these things, there are no numbers. We don't specify what numbers you've got to show that content. Um, advanced technical and or science topics appropriate to the program and a general education component. Um, and then the other thing is that you have to have a uh, curriculum culminating in comprehensive projects or experiences based on the cumulative knowledge and skills acquired in earlier coursework. 
And that becomes a sticking point, particularly with some of the natural science programs. It means you, you, know, you either have to have a project in your senior year or an internship or externship or you know, some kind of a, a, or a course that deals with points of that. It, the idea is to bring together what they've learned and be able to show. It's not, it's not a capstone the way it is for engineering, but it's a culminating experience. And then faculty, again, we don't give a quantity but you have to be able to show that it's sufficient to achieve the objectives, competent to cover all curricular areas. And the third one, which is really important, the authority for creation, delivery, evaluation, modification, and continuous improvement. So you're, you have to have faculty in the program that have power over that program. Um, you know, I remember I was at a conference of another thing and somebody was giving a talk about their online program and it, the faculty had no, it was all adjuncts and they had no control over it. It was all being dictated from somewhere else. I thought, well, they better not apply to us for accreditation because <laughs> they're not going to get it. And then facilities, again, same thing, adequate, you know, to accomplish the educational objectives, modern tools, equipment, computing resources, labs appropriate to the program, library services. So again, you have to demonstrate that you have what's sufficient to adequately cover it. And, you know, facilities, this is kind of what they're talking about. Um, institutional support sufficient to attract, retain, and provide for continued professional development of faculty, sufficient to acquire, maintain, and operate facilities and equipment. And then, you know, the program criteria, if there is any. Um, master's level, it's the fulfillment of the baccalaureate level general criteria and one academic year of study beyond it, and a project or research activity demonstrating both the mastery of the subject matter and a high level of communication skills. So um, one thing to know with regards to this in terms of the process that I just wanted to add is that when you go through your visit and the team leaves and says, you know, you have this, these weaknesses or these deficiencies or whatever, that's not the end of the story. You, it, we are a continuous improvement. You have until the following July to resolve those and many, many, many programs resolve deficiencies and weaknesses in the course of the year. You have, we, we do a, um, after the team leaves the campus, they write a draft statement, and that goes through the whole editing chain, as Dr. Milligan was talking about, and then it goes to the institution, and they have 30 days to respond, and then that goes back through the whole chain again until we go to the summer commission meeting where the whole commission votes on it, and we have had people submit supplemental materials up until the month before the summer meetings, which have resolved the whatever the shortcomings were. So it's never over until it's over. It's just another point. So that's basically my presentation. A little closer. Okay, very good. All right, a couple things I wanted to add and then we'll open it up. But you know, you touched about institutional support from a program level. I think that's really important, right? I mean, you know, we part of what we do is make sure the institution is supporting the program. So I know traditionally uh, in some of the programs that we've visited, you know, I did one in Texas. It wasn't the University of Texas. It was another university in Texas. I won't tell you which one. But as a computer engineering, and they were uh, lacking in some digital electronics uh, experience for students in the computer engineering program. And so when we left, they decided, we didn't tell them, but they decided that they wanted to introduce a course. They created a course and they hired a faculty person, right? And the institution was the one that backed them up on that. And they were the ones that acted up, ended up funding all that. So, you know, the institutional support is a key component of making all this work. The faculty power, it's power is maybe, either, I don't know if that's the right word or not, but faculty involvement, because you can't have a continuous improvement process if the people that are running the program don't have an opportunity to provide input on how to make things better. It is the faculty are the ones that really are doing it because they're the ones that are sort of in the trenches, if you will, with the students. So if something's not working right, the faculty are the ones that are going to know about it. So they're the ones that have to provide input, which is why, in the case that you mentioned where they're all adjuncts, they had no input into the program, it just, it just doesn't work. And then the last thing I wanted to mention when uh, Amanda opened up and said we're getting into the applied sciences, or I'm sorry, the natural sciences area in, in a more meaningful way, it's demand driven. We didn't go out and start passing out coupons for ABET accreditation. I mean, programs were coming to us wanting to be accredited. Uh, many from inside the U.S., many from outside the U.S. And it's, it's demand driven. It's not the other way around. We're not pushing. Um, it's, it's really been uh, externally generated. So I just want to make sure uh, that you Right. We, we accredited our first geology program, University of Arkansas, Little Rock, and when they came to us, the, the um, 
faculty member in charge of it uh, is in the engineering department, so he was very familiar with ABET. He said, we want to do this. And he said, you know, our state requires external reviews. And so we figured, well, this is the best way to do it. It's a win-win. Number one, you get an external review from a, an, an organization that you know has quality reviews. And, and two is, at the end of the day, you have accreditation. You're ABET accredited. And um, on that visit, we had the state uh, licensing body came as an observer on the visit. And some of the state licensing bodies were very excited to hear that ABET was getting into geology because they knew it meant that they could count on a level of um, competence in the graduates who come to them to become licensed if they graduate from ABET accredited programs. So that was the other point in relation to where it's going from. Okay, great. We have about uh, 17 or so minutes, and so I'm sure there are still lots of questions and comments and, and maybe even some discussion uh, that will likely last beyond this. And so uh, we'll go ahead and make sure make sure you use the mics to, to uh, ask it. And, and whether it's of, of them or just even conversation about, you know, should this be something that that AMS board and higher education pursues as, as a thing to do a full, to, down to the program level, because obviously one can do this and institutions can do this without the AMS involvement just on the general criteria. So. I, I found it was valuable that you mentioned that this first natural science was University of Arkansas geology, where there is a register, there's a professional registered geology, and ABED is often associated with the PE. I know they are distinct things, right. but how many of these natural science programs that are ABED accredited that you've done are not associated with a professional licensing like RG or PE? Okay, so. Um the only other, we have many disciplines that are accredited under the Applied Natural Science Accreditation Commission. The only other one that has licensing is surveying. Um, since practically the beginning of ANSAC, we had industrial hygiene. They don't have licensing. We have safety. They don't have licensing. Now, they have created their own certification, and they all acknowledge ABET accreditation, but it gives them like a year off of whatever, so it's not huge. Um, health physics, same thing. Um, we just added construction management. They don't have licensing. Facility management, the International Facility Management Association has just applied to ABET to become a member, and they want to bring the 26 programs they already accredit into ABET, and they just informed me that eight more programs told them at their annual meeting that they want to apply for ABET accreditation. None of those have licensing. so. You know, that's why in the booklet that we handed out and other things, when we're talking to the natural science programs and we're talking to the non-licensed programs, they have to look at what other things are of value to them. And one of them is, you know, the external reviews, um, the assessment, you know, in general, many of you know if you're tied in with the engineering programs, that the institutions say, okay, you're ABET accredited, we don't need you to do whatever when we go through our regional accreditation. I know I went to a meeting of the Council on Higher Education Accreditation a few years ago, and we were in some workshop, and the woman talking was from one of the regional accreditors, and I said, well, you know, I'm from ABET, and we've been doing outcomes based since 2000. And she said, oh, we owe ABET a big, Thanks, because you drove in the outcomes based and you've given us, shown us the way, which was really cool. So, you know, those are all elements. It helps you with dealing with your institution. And I know that I've heard that from my, from the industrial hygiene and safety programs. They all say, you know, we don't have any problem with that. They accept our stuff or else they come to us and they want us to help other people because they know we know how to do it. So those are the, the big things. And of course, as it becomes more recognized in those arenas, because a lot of people in the sciences don't know it, but you know, from our vantage point, we've moved into STEM. We will move beyond engineering a long time ago into community sciences and then into applied sciences, and now it's really STEM. And we're getting a big, a big uh, demand for math from abroad. We've accredited math and actuarial sciences and financial math and a few other things internationally, and every year now we're getting more and more requests. And this year we're doing our first visit to a domestic physics program. So it's starting to open up domestically in ways that are interesting. Yeah, um, I'll give a, a different perspective, maybe um, kind of an administrative uh, perspective, because I worked in the provost office for a number of years as director of program review. Um, and so one of the things, um, when we had, I think most institutions have external program review already over a certain cycle. Um, so when we um, had, had that, um, 
the, each pro, one of the problematic things I had was that um, if individual programs um, suggested um, uh, reviewers, sometimes we, I had to say, no, you can't have one of your friends come in and review. And so I think that was one of the issues. I think in terms of cost, um, I would have to say that probably the ABET was a little bit more expensive, but not a whole lot expensive, uh, more expensive because um, it costs money to bring in those external reviewers, um, pay them for their services, and so on. So I think, um, and at our institution, maybe different other places, um, the provost office paid for that, whether it was ABET or other external uh, reviewers. So that's one perspective um, that we are, I mean, I think Amanda made this point too. We, we do have to pay for external reviewers. Uh, I think it's probably up to each um, department, each institution to see what the difference in that cost is, but it's not that there's, uh, it's not replacing another cost. I like how you have the flexibility to allow different disciplines to bring in their own subject material and so forth. In meteorology, atmospheric science, when you talk about what topics are covered in a bachelor's program in meteorology, we have three different competing specifications. One is from the National Weather Service telling us what a meteorologist courses need to take. That's the most outdated and ridiculous because <laughs> they don't hire meteorologists anymore. The second medium one is from the United Nations World Meteorological Organization. They have a web page specifying what it takes to be a meteorologist. And I'd say the best one is the AMS one, um, which is perhaps the most flexible. But there are three competing ones. And so if we are unlucky enough to get a visitor to our program who happens to be from the National Weather Service, they're going to look at us and, and say, well, you're not following our program. But, and that's one of the reasons that Dr. Milligan was talking about the rigorous training we put people through, because we beat out of them the fact that they can come in and say, this isn't how we do it at my school, so therefore you're doing it wrong. You know, it, it, you're, you're dealing with the criteria, and if AMS becomes a member of ABET, AMS determines what that program criteria is, and then it gets published for a year for review and comment, and all those other you know, stakeholders can come in and, and, and weigh in on it, and then that will go back to AMS to then determine whether they're going to propose changing it, and then it goes to our criteria committee for a further review of it, and then it goes to our area delegation, the board, for final approval. So there is a process for public comment on the thing, but at the end of the day, AMS is deciding that. And it's interesting because I just, um, dealing with the safety professionals, it was, it was interesting with them because they, back in the 80s, they said, okay, enough with the janitor, you know, coming in and saying I'm the safety professional. We want the profession recognized. So they started with doing certification, and then they started dealing with what's the body of knowledge, and then they defined that, and then they started accrediting, and then they decided that they would come into ABET after they had accredited a slew of programs, and so they brought their programs into ABET. And they were very clear from the beginning that it was all about building the profession and making clear what the profession is, and that they were going to determine that. And then, you know, other people can provide input to the society, but the society that becomes a member of ABET that is the society that really has the deciding hand. We don't allow, I mean, you only are evaluated against criteria, period. Because the thing about training is if you don't train people, they're going to fall back on what they know and what they're comfortable with, which is what I do at my institution. And people have opinions. Certainly it's a human process, but I can, there's not a lot of things I can guarantee you, but I will guarantee you that you will never get any kind of adverse action that's not based on the criteria that's published, because that's the only thing that we will allow our reviewers to evaluate against, period. And that's one of the reasons we have this consistency checking at the, at the team level, so that we weed out any uh, possible you know, outliers that way. And not only that, but the, if, if AMS becomes a member of ABET, they put a commissioner on the commission, and then when those decisions are made, those decisions come up and everybody on the commission reads all the decisions, and the societies involved will say, excuse me, this is not consistent with our criteria, and if it's not consistent, it's not going to go through. Yeah, it won't get that far. It'll get killed before that. 
I have a comment on that. I think it was at the last Heads and Chairs meeting the subject of accreditation sort of spontaneously came up. And Kevin and I were sitting over here someplace, and it got around to the competing criteria, the Weather Service Form 1340 and all the stuff that it says. And the main difference really is the 1340 still requires differential equations, and the AMS guideline does not. But we were sitting there, and I don't know, I think you just randomly decide we would Google Form 1330 and see what it came up. And I don't remember, if, I think that we just said, let's try 1330 and see what comes up. And just to see what other federal agencies have. Well, it turned out to be geo, geo something, I don't remember what it was. And the criteria that they had for federal employment in that area was bachelor's degree from an accredited institution and this, period. That was it. Now, the Weather Service is in a multi-year process of revising the Form 1340. That's been going on for three or four years at least at this point, and they're not done yet. Now, uh, we had a member of the uh, Weather Service on the committee we had, John Ogren, and we asked him, like, when, when are you guys going to finish revising the 1340 and what's it going to be like? And he said, well, the idea of getting rid of physics too, he said, well, that's going to go away. He said, what we're going to probably do is follow what the AMS has, but the, they're the federal government and it will take them years to do anything. But just imagine that there was accredited programs in meteorology. It would take years to get to the point of the Weather Service actually doing that, but it would simplify their process very easily to say, you came from an accredited program. I, I would say they would take leadership from AMS because you now in the position of defining what the profession looks like. They would want to maybe have some input and you would take that, but you so now my ones, question. that would be a leadership role. Now my question, because we have talked about this, Amanda and I, but I don't think I heard this in your presentation. Suppose the AMS decided, yes, we would like to join ABET. What does the AMS have to do? You said they have to put someone on the board, we have to supply the criteria right, and so well, on. But exactly, yeah. what does the AMS have to do and then how much would that cost? Right, okay. Well, I, I can talk in general terms, we'll talk together on this. I mean, basically what you're doing is you're applying and you have to um, demonstrate that you represent the profession, period. I mean, because there could be other bodies out there that would say, hey, no, it's us, or, you know, whatever. So you would demonstrate that and you would back that up with facts. And part of that would be through your membership. Part of it would be from letters of support, okay, and you would get those letters of support uh, potentially from National Weather Service, I suppose, or, uh, or and or uh, institutions, programs, and said, yeah, you know, we, we would like AMS to be the lead society for atmospheric sciences or meteorology or whatever. At ABED, and, we'll, and, and we plan to, to seek accreditation sometime in the future using you know, AMS uh, leadership and whatnot. And so we have a membership committee that meets, that reviews those types of things. We look at other things, stability, are you financially able to do what you can do, and do you have the expertise to supply the commissions and the evaluators and all those kinds of things. So um, it's involved in that. Uh, and then separately from that, um, I don't know if we charge a membership fee actually. Oh, yeah. Why? Yeah, well, the I, assessment I fee for a society, yeah. Well, yes, but I'm, I mean the actual membership fee. Yeah. That's a detail I have to. We can probably talk on the side, but um, uh, yeah, there's a fee that AMS will pay to to maintain their membership in ABIT on a yearly basis, and there's a flat part of it, and then there's a per program part of it. But I can talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the the uh, in terms of what a society then is respect expected to do. Number one, they write the program criteria. Number two, they give us the program evaluators, which means that you have to be able to get from your membership sufficient number of people to go through the training to be willing to go out and do the visits because the teams, as we said, are made up of a team chair who's from the commission, and then the program evaluators from the society. Then the commission, then the society puts a commissioner on the ABET commission, and then they provide a board member for the board of delegates. So those are the different things. ABET pays the uh, travel expenses for the training. You know, when they come for the program evaluator training, ABET pays for that. ABET pays for the commissioner expenses when they're on commission. ABET pays all the expenses for visits. The only thing, the only two things that we don't pay for are the travel expenses. If you send one of your people out as an observer on a visit after they've qualified as a program evaluator, the society pays that expense, and the society pays the expense for their board delegate to come to the board meeting twice a year. So, so dovetailing from Tony's question about what would be required of AMS if they were to join ABET, a question for Keith, perhaps: What would AMS want? 
to see or know in, from the community in order to say, yes, we want to go forward with this? Would it be a recommendation, well, presumably a recommendation of the Board of Higher Ed, but what else, if anything else, would the society need in order to take that step? I think it's just a sense from, from universities and uh, programs that it is the direction that you want AMS to be at. But I think it would be, be reacting to what the community is asking for. Are you sure really talking to the university? Because we've got to cost us money. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of whether AMS thinks it's good or you want, it might be, it's going to cost us money. We might be against it. So we're here for that. This is actually coming from the program. So I just have, this is just general comments to everyone in the room based on my personal experiences at Rutgers. I'm in the Department of Environmental Sciences there. We have three undergraduate programs. Meteorology is one, that's the one I'm involved in. But we also have Environmental Sciences and Bioenvironmental Engineering, which is ABET accredited. So we know what the work in terms of time you know, involves. It, it does involve a lot of time to be ABET accredited. And in fact, our Environmental Science program was approached I had ABET to be involved in the accreditation process that they're doing with environmental science, and the faculty discussed it and came to the conclusion they didn't want to do it because of the time commitment, and they didn't see uh, the advantages so that outright outweighing those disadvantages for that particular program anyway. And um, one of the things they were talking about was the demand, and I was thinking to myself, you know, I talked to parents and prospective students and current students and employers and the only person I talked to that used the, has told or has said the word accreditation to me has been the dean. No parents, no students, no employers, uh, et cetera, at least in my experience in our program at Rutgers. So, and I certainly see some advantages, but there are disadvantages too that certainly need to be considered. Great, thank you all. So uh, I've put up uh, a uh, link here uh, to start to get at this idea of where is the community at in this discussion. This is by no means definitive. This is but the start of, of some of that feedback uh, from people who were here to hear this full conversation. Um, as uh, chair of the AMS board in higher education, uh, I want to take this feedback. It's short three question thing. Uh, it's a Google form, so you can quickly fill it out. It's anonymous. I'm not recording your emails. Um, and so I really do want to know where everyone sits in the room. Um, there is a place for, for just, for, uh, there's two questions that will be more, um, you know, kind of yes, no, how to, strength of feeling, and then an open comment block. And so in that open comment block, um, if you want to further discuss where your feelings are at this point, whether it's the, I like this idea of continuous improvement and assessment aspects, I don't know at all about the cost because of how my university would, would act. Those are some serious questions that, that are obviously going to need to take place over more time than what we can do here, what we can do over the next day and a half. But if you can give me a sense of that, that will help then guide the board on how we might then take this conversation forward so we don't come back just two years from now, or four years from now, or ten years from now, so that we can really make either progress on this as, as we decide we want to move forward on this in a way or that we want to just uh, bolster things that are already happening within the community in terms of our external reviews that a lot of us are already doing for deans and stuff like that. And then those institutions that do want an ABET accreditation can still do it through general criteria if they wanted to. Okay, and so uh, please, uh, it, it, during this break, continue the conversation. We'll have a chance for one more kind of question or comment here, uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll be in break, and, and both these folks will still be around uh, um, through at least, uh, at least the break, and then I think Amanda's gonna be around the rest of the, both around for the rest of the day, great. Uh, and, and obviously these conversations are gonna continue probably throughout the next day and a half. So we'll first, it, it is up now and available and uh, until I decide to not make it available. <laughs> sure, and, and I, can, I can put it as a part of the, the course materials and, and obviously I'll probably look at it tomorrow at some point just to kind of get a sense, but, but I, I don't have plans to take it down in the near, in the near future. I'm not gonna publish it widely because First, I want just from the people who are in this room, talk with other people, yes, but, but to, to get a sense of, of where everyone's at. Do I? I thought I, thought I did a shareable link. I, I will then get another, um, 
If you do not have a Google account, we'll, we'll figure out another way of, of doing <laughs> that. Sorry. Kind of accreditation in, in general. Um, obviously, here we have a particular aspect of one way we could do that, but there are, as, as was mentioned, other ways to do accreditation uh, and stuff like that. So really more, more the accreditation in general, ABET of which would be one avenue to, to go down that path. OK, so it, it may seem just like an artificial issue of semantics, but uh, with the breadth and expanding breadth of our field and fields, we have degrees in meteorology, in atmospheric science, in atmospheric physics, in climate science. How would those different flavors possibly be addressed in this? I think is something that if we ever going to intend to go this way, we have to figure out, the, go through the weeds of that, uh, whether those would be separate, those that are entailed in one thing, uh, AGU input as well as AMS, as well as um, where the boundaries are for those. Yeah, and that's so. So, uh, from my perspective right now, as as the chair of, of the board in higher education, right now we only have one statement. Although there has been conversation, like is that appropriate? And and so th those would be continuing conversations that then I think the society, if if the society became a member of ABET, would need it to tackle before then you know furthering it on that process and helping us define what it is we're trying to accredit at that point. And that's it is a complication as we're as we're changing <laughs> the field and as the field is changing and just society is changing and, and some of these more cross disciplinary type things. So, yeah. well, one one thing in relation to ABET accreditation, there's two ways you could go with it. One is you can just do atmospheric science and similarly name programs and cover it all under one set of program criteria. Or you could write separate program criteria for each area. You know, you could do that. You could submit three, four different program criteria or whatever. So are you accrediting the degree program or the major? Because the program. Lauren was saying, you're talking about multiple majors within a degree program, not different degree programs, right? Or the, the Um, the, the rule in terms of ABET is um, we accredit programs. So say you have a program and it's got different options. You can go two different ways. One is you could, you could accredit just the option, and that's as a program. Or you could credit the, the program, and then all the options under it would be accredited. If you do it the second way, every single one of those has to meet the criteria. Um, but if you do it per, and we have a number if you look on the ABET, you know, um, website, you know, there are things that are options, you know, and so only the option is accredited. So again, that would probably be largely a society-driven decision as to how we de design the, the program criteria to then determine yeah. whether it'd be the single option or whether we could do multiple. Well, no, those these are two different things. In other words, I'm saying, he was saying, if you have a program at a university, say you had one set of criteria and they had a program and they wanted to do each one of their options, you can do each one of the options separately or you could do it under the umbrella of the overarching program, but then each all of those options have to meet the criteria. As for the society, the society can sum, could either submit atmospheric science or meteorological science and similarly named programs and swoop it all and then you define what similarly named is, or you could write separate right. program criteria. Exactly, yes, right. All right, so uh, uh, let me know individually if you have uh, trouble uh, submitting feedback, if you do not have a, a way to, to Google to Googleize, if you will. Um, otherwise, we are in break. Uh, so I take this opportunity to stand up, continue chatting, and uh, uh, we will uh, gather back at uh, some time. <laughs>
accreditation, but I've seen what ABET, I've seen the workload that ABET has. I know what the financial burden of ABET is. And I know, given that, I have to go to the world. But they also just indicated that construction management has a lot of I now need to talk with our people.
as you come back in, uh, the speakers for the next session are going to want you to maybe mix it up a bit. I know, meeting new people. For us introverts, it's hard, so yeah, mix it up. We'll mix it up. We'll take this outside, right? Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll help with the mixing up, too. Okay, perfect. So just be aware of that. You may not be sitting stationary for the whole time. Is everybody in? Is coming in? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, so let them move in. Let them move in. Okay. Okay. So, Kevin, you tell me when you want me to, to go. Yeah, I, I was just about to introduce oh, the session. Oh, okay, okay. Trying to gather them all back. Yeah, that looks like it's like herding cats. cats so. so you will tell them. You will tell us why. Oh, no, you know. <laughs> I would say this was a great idea that Val came up with on a yeah. conference call, and th that's why we have this. <laughs> Just stop making suggestions. All right, so one last uh, afternoon uh, session here for us before our reception this evening. Uh, so we have uh, uh, three folks with us uh, that are going to lead a session on developing a culture of positive mentorship of students and colleagues. Uh, this was uh, uh, an idea that came up uh, when, when uh, Val and I were on a conference call to help organize uh, this meeting, uh, and especially as we, we deal with a lot of new issues with students uh, that come into our office and that we may not yet really understand how to how to work with that and in, in kind of more of this idea of mentorship and, and helping them along uh, and helping ourselves along uh, to achieve all that we want to achieve. So we have uh, Valerie Sloan from UCAR. NCAR, yes. NCAR, UCAR. Uh, Rebecca Hacker from NCAR. And uh, Carolyn Brinkworth from UCAR now. Yes, Some of them have, <laughs> have switched around from NCAR, UCAR. It kind of happened. So uh, they are here and going to lead us through a great session this afternoon. And so it will uh, invariably be interactive. So. Uh, if you uh, do end up moving tables, please bring your uh, uh, chips, guacamole, and salsa with you. Otherwise, they may not be there when you get back. <laughs> That's right. Take it away. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for hanging in there. I know it's been a long day or a week, and uh, appreciate you. we appreciate you being here. Um, so this is a topic that uh, we know that you really are um, well fami familiar with. And um, you know we're not trying to tell you things you don't know, but want to help. and. Uh, appreciate, especially as chairs and heads of departments, that you're dealing with um, issues um, all the time from you know, students and colleagues and um, being able to, having to listen to issues and listen to people. And so um, we, we want to try to help with the development of supportive departmental cultures that will make it easier for you guys, especially, and everybody in the department. Um, to then be able to focus on the work at hand and you know actually be able to focus on science and, and research for example um, so uh, this this is an adopted adapted or adopted from the earth science women's network and it's a mentor map um, different areas that a person um, let's say a grad student or a faculty member or even undergraduate needs support in different in these different areas and um, for example sponsorship is when uh, somebody behind your back says something positive and says oh you should really nominate Rick for this um, opportunity um, access to opportunities of course sharing those with students and other and faculty accountability for what really matters for example having a heart to heart with someone like are you are you really sure that this is what's making you happy? Like, it sounds like you'd really rather go into the private sector, that kind of thing. Um, 
Role models can be, of course, a lot of different kinds and aspects of people. Um, and creating a, a safe space for talking about uh, difficult topics. Um, intellectual community, having that stimulation of being able to talk about your science and um, different aspects of research. Emotional support, you know, encouragement and so on. Professional development, helping people prepare their, their tenure track packages or applications for an NSF GRF. And then substantive feedback, um, particularly, you know, we think about that in terms of, of the work uh, that they're doing um, on a paper or research, giving feedback. And often when we think about uh, mentoring, we sort of have, I think, traditionally thought about providing the substantive feedback and um, the intellectual community as well as uh, professional development. And so we just wanted to kind of, you know, broaden that because really um, it's important for um, a community like a department to provide these other aspects in order for less energy to be going to dealing with those things and more to be going to the, the, the task at hand. Um, and so those might include emotional support, like being really encouraging. Um, as I said, you know, creating a space where you can talk about the difficult things, like how do you do a dual application for a faculty position? Or what's going on with this um, PhD committee where there's an unpleasant dynamic or something like that? Or what about harassment or some really difficult, really difficult piece of, of the news? How, how are you supporting? supporting that and so we, we want to just uh, sort of broaden that that um, to say you know to create a supportive c culture in in your department it really pays off you're, you're getting you're, you're relieving you're allowing sort of a release or a relief relief to people who feel a lot of stress and that includes pretty much everybody um, and there is, you know, as I say, this is nothing surprising to you uh, that, for instance, our students feel stress. There's more and more you see in the mainstream media articles, Chronicle for Higher Education, Inside Higher Ed, um, research and uh, numbers that show tremendously high uh, rates of anxiety and depression amongst grad students. And in some cases, you know, suicide as well. So, um, and for example, the research is showing that um, half of grad students report emotional or stress-related health problems. Of those, only about a third seek help, and most many are not aware of resources. And then also that those with marginalized identities face worse um, mental and physical health outcomes than their peers. So they feel even more stress to perform, to represent their race, uh, to show, act like there's nothing wrong. So um, it's important to, to acknowledge this and um, also to acknowledge that you, that you guys are supporting people that are in the state and it's difficult, it's challenging. Also among academics, um, it came up this morning, you know, expected to be doing more and more with the limited amount of time that you have and without additional salary <laughs> benefits. And that might not even make a difference. But, you know, the, the idea that uh, now, now because of electronics, we can be in bed working on our laptop and be um, accessible to uh, our students and other people. And, on that particular point, I just want to just mention that um, the idea, and this, this can come up in one of the solutions, but I just want to highlight it as modeling uh, work-life balance by, for example, not sending work emails at night or on weekends, not responding to them, and creating a culture in all of your communities, you know, unless it's maybe a really dire, like a grant proposal deadline or something, creating a culture where it's you know, you don't have to, like the student doesn't feel like they have to reply at 11 p.m. because you wrote to them at 10 p.m. So think about how you model that. Um, yes, and so again, these are now, there's lots of research backing you up on your feelings of being <laughs> overtaxed. Um, that there's you know, heavy workloads, more and more expectations. 
and that doing, you know, this quote stood out to me in an article, and it was, doing first class research is a full time job. Doing first class teaching is a full time job. And there's a limit to how many full time jobs one individual can hold down. And that doesn't count service and um, academic mentoring. So, um, you know, in, in the background or the context of all of these, then we have additional um, stressors, and Carolyn's going to come and um, talk a little bit about these. Thank you, Vaughn. I appreciate it. I have so much to say about the next two slides, and I got about three minutes per slide, so if all of you all want to talk later about it, I'm happy to be around. But um, there's a lot of... Um, research out there that shows that when students um, leave academia and leave departments, it is very rarely because of their aptitude. It is more often about their willingness to tolerate the social situation in which they find themselves. And a big aspect of this is the campus climate. Uh, with this first slide is about racial tensions in particular. Um, we know this is an example of a, a climate survey that was done at a university that should remain nameless, um, but um, it's an example. Okay, So you have things like f only 46% of students of color felt the course and structures challenged offensive comments. So it's still 54% of folks who were in those situations where an offensive comment was made and their instructors did not challenge that comment. Not challenging comments like that, it, it's complicity. Okay, let me just say that up front. You know, if we are not co if we are not challenging those comments, we are creating hostile environments. We're not only not creating safe environments; we're abetting hostile environments for students. The interesting thing about race and gender on campus is we, we have this tendency to believe that a student's race really shouldn't matter in terms of you know how well they're doing. The best students are going to rise to the top. Science is a meritocracy. Let me disabuse you of that motion, notion right now, OK? If you all want to read more about this, my thesis was written um, about this. Is, and I wrote a blog post about this called the myth, of, the myth and Reality of Meritocracy. You can go and take a read of that about why it is that we have so much difficulty actually creating meritocracies in science departments. And the difficulty is, is that when we don't even talk about this stuff, if we are not willing and capable of talking about race and talking about gender, then we are not supporting our students. The thing that Val was saying about safe spaces, we need to be able to have these conversations. And if you are not comfortable having a conversation about race, you need to get comfortable having a conversation about race. Okay? We are creating a lot of uh, trainings now. So one thing that uh, we are doing at the AMS um, in January is we are doing an entire short course um, to talk about diversity and inclusion, to talk about gender, to talk about race, to give you tools for bystander intervention. So when somebody does say something offensive, we're going to help you to figure out how to intervene and uh, deal with that comment. The danger is, is when we don't talk about these things um, and we pretend that it's a meritocracy, um, we end up doing something which is which is called gaslighting. Okay, and for those of you who don't know what gaslighting is, gaslighting is a tactic that's actually used by abusers in abusive relationships, where they, you know something is not right and something is not fair, and people will keep telling you, yeah, but it is, but it is, it's completely fair. So the abuser will basically say to you and, and, and try and challenge um, you and make you think that what you're experiencing is not actually reality, okay? It's a class, classic abusive um, tactic. The problem is, is that when we have students who are experiencing these campus climates uh, around problems around race and gender, and we say, no, 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 it's a meritocracy, we're essentially gaslighting our students. So we've got to get good at talking about this stuff, um, else we are not going to um, be able to provide that supportive environment for our students. And we know from the research that not talking about it actually makes things worse. So there are racial tensions happening on, on, on campus. Um, there are also is a whole but litany of um, situations of sexual harassment in the sciences. We know this is happening. We need to get good at talking about it. So here's a whole bunch of different cases, which is just depressing, frankly. Um, and we need to get much better about dealing with these things, um, put things in place that mean this kind of thing can no longer happen. The other piece I want to talk about, which again it comes back to this gaslighting, is what's called the duck syndrome. And we have a tendency to want everyone to feel that um, we've got it under control. It's all okay. We're gliding along beautifully along the surface of this pond and everything's a okay. We're not even trying. It's all cool. Okay? What's actually happening underneath is this. Right? We are frantically paddling as hard as we possibly can to make it look like we're all okay and that everything's okay and there's no problems here. Right? This is not helpful. 
What this does, again, is a form of gaslighting. So you end up with students who feel like they're struggling. They're looking around. Everybody else is doing just fine. They're sailing by. And they're all of a sudden thinking, why me? Why can't I get my act together? Why am I struggling so hard? And we do it all as well. You know, I know several people in this room who have like deep things going on in their personal lives right now, me included. And we're all here going, oh, no, it's all fine. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> We got to start talking about these things and ac accepting and admitting and being supportive to each other that we got more than science going on. We got humanity going on, and we've got to get better at having those discussions. I'm going to pass over to Rebecca. Okay. Um, thank you, Carolyn and Val. So, what we would love to do is actually instead of us keeping at you, do some work together in breakout groups. And we want to A, acknowledge that we're all the duck doing this. I'm one of them. I'm frantically pedaling. Um, and helping each other, sharing tips and maybe resources of what you've tried to do, what you would like to do on your campus, and also making, making a list of uh, resources that you could really use and haven't quite found yet. And maybe we can then bring that together. So what we will do, and I will show you a little bit more to these breakout sessions in a second, but we would love to spend some time breaking out in small groups, maybe in, we have how many now? So groups of four or five, is that the idea? And you Okay, so what we'll do to get you moving and so you can actually sit at the table with people that you haven't shared a lot of thought with today is we'll count off uh, by six and you get to sit with other people, move around, gather around one of the easels, select a reporter or note taker, and discuss a couple of questions that I will show you in a second. And I will show you them and then we'll do the counting off and moving around. And then we'll come back and ask that you report out uh, from the session. And I invite you to dig deeper or talk about other things. These are just a couple of uh, pointers that you could start off with. But the overall idea is how are you creating supportive environments for all of your students and faculty in your department? And here's some conversation openers. Do you, we have open conversations about failure, pressure, and doubt. So do we talk about the duck? Uh, do we speak about the national news or how does it impact our lives? So if a dramatic shooting happens or a big event um, in the national news, how do you come in in the morning into your department? And what do you tell your faculty to say about that? And I know at some of these heads and chairs meetings, we've talked about these things, how hard it is if you have a protest on campus and people are deeply impacted by it and you have to keep your classes going, right? So those kind of issues. Are we providing easy access to mental health care and support? How are you supporting students and faculty to have a work-by-life balance? So we've had in the past really good conversations about what is going on in your departments, and I would love to bring that up um, again and kind of going to this, like how many of us are working the new night shift and what does that mean for your department overall? What is the expectation? And then hopefully leading to how can we support each other as a community and what type of resources can we share? And also uh, Carolyn's question, how can UCAR support you and how can NCAR support you? Because we are very willing uh, to put some work into this and in providing resources, but we want to provide the right ones. So. Um, if you bring things forward that you would like to see, uh, we are very open to hearing that today. So if that sounds good, and again, you can also take the conversation somewhere else. But I would love for us to count off right now um, to six and um, form new groups. And why don't we start here?
hope you remember. <laughs> I hope you remembered your number. So ones, ones over here.
five folks. We're going to give you five more minutes. So, so five minutes, get everything you want to talk about on paper, and then we'll come back as a big group. Okay, folks, you've got one minute. So finish the thought that you are thinking or speaking about right now. And we've got one minute. Okay, folks, uh, five, four, three, two, one, and we're done. Everybody back here. Group number one, I can still see you talking. Okay, everybody. So we're going to go around. 
Can I have everybody's attention again? So we're going to go around. Uh, please use the mic, OK? Now, when you're using a mic, please actually put it up to your mouth. I feel that we have difficulty with that sometimes when people are using microphones. So um, we're going to try and use a mic as opposed to just hold it. Um, I'm going to nominate you folks to start, though, if you wouldn't mind. So you've got three minutes, two minutes or three minutes? Two minutes to tell us what is on your big pad of paper. And then we're going to like work out. We're going to go around, and then we're going to work out uh, what the common pieces are and what we actually want to talk about. So. I am timing you. Yes, give me a 30 second warning if you could, please, Carolyn, if I keep going too long. So, we spent the most time on the first question about open conversations about failure, pressure, and doubt. And our general consensus was that if students were open to this, then yes, we didn't necessarily seek them out to have those conversations, but if they sought us out, then uh, we would. There are challenges associated with underrepresented students, like the females. Uh, I can speak in my program. We don't have any female faculty members. At Plymouth State, there's just one. And so people like that or from other underrepresented groups, having someone to whom they feel like they can reach out to to speak out about failure, pressure, and doubt is a challenge. Uh, tying into the third point, campus resources exist for students who are struggling with this, but do we know about these? And how well are we able to share these with the students? And so are there people who students perceive, and we underlined perceive, because it's not necessarily people who are accessible, but it's what matters is what the students perceive as your accessibility, and what are the actions that we can do to help facilitate that through body language, through direct actions like having our doors open, things of that nature. What is the department's culture in that regard? Um, an importance of authenticity and oh, just a willingness to say or share things like I don't know or share your failures. Rebecca gave us a good example of CU and what she's done here with uh, ASP about having an opportunity to present a slide and say here's something I don't know so that you don't have this perception of the teacher scholar who knows everything. So kind of turning this on its head and how can we uh, facilitate that within our programs and groups. Uh, we did also touch on the uh, second and fourth uh, topics up there as well. When it comes to national news, generally politics not, unless it interfaced with weather and climate, uh, so things like climate change would. Uh, there's some thought that maybe sometimes students come to class to escape the negativity of the world, that there's a mass murder out there. Well, I want to come and learn about the weather because I'm going to have this cognitive dissonance. It's too sad, too frustrating to uh, deal with. Um, 30, 30 seconds left. 30 seconds left? All right, well, we're just about done. The last one about supporting students and faculty on their work-life balance, mentor them. A suggestion of scheduling fun time first, but of course having it be balanced. Don't schedule too much fun time, and then don't leave anything for your actual work uh, or your studies. Prioritize and assess what those priorities actually would be, and just thinking about these as actions we can disseminate to our students. Thank you so much. Great job. Um, we started with, um, I don't know if we followed the question. We started with mental health issues. Um, part of that was how does it affect others if you have someone with mental health issues, whether a faculty member, and that leaks out to others. It, it has a pretty profound impact on, on the whole faculty. Um, um, the trust of discussion, how to keep that trust, the, which kind of goes along with the closed door, along with the stigma. And so that's, that's a difficult conversation. Um, and then for graduate students, the university mental health professionals are not necessarily geared to graduate students. They're geared to undergraduate students. So that's a real problem for some schools. Um, then we talked about mentoring. Um, problems with implementing. We might talk about it, but how do we implement it? Um, faculty to junior faculty, um, mostly to avoid the fear of, of the mentoring from the chair. Um, or the head. Um, and then for undergraduates, maybe the AMS chapters, the upperclassmen with some social events, for those mentoring. And then for graduate students, how do we do mentoring? I don't know if we came up with any examples there. I write big. Got about a minute left. And then we talked about work-life balance family and it's nice for professors we felt like there was flex for fa professors 
but is there for graduate students and communicating that they at least need to take, I think we said one day, and understand that they need to stop, even though it's a 24-7 job, lifestyle, adventure, I think Bill said. Um, <laughs> Um, along with that was the workload ramification. If your university wants you to account for every single minute of your day um, for the bean counting. <laughs> and not acknowledge that they're actually doing that. Um, and then what's the family impact, both again, for graduate students. Um, so we asked about, um, is there paid le parental leave for graduate students? Um, didn't quite get to the question of was there parental leave for faculty for the for the men at my table um, at your university. And then childcare was brought up. There's not? You don't have? <sighs> Talk to me. Um, and then could you use, even though like an NSF grant won't provide for paid leave for graduate students, is there some way to get that money for those graduate students who, who did just have a child? And, and because they're going to be good grad students, but you gotta give them that break, much as we have to give our faculty a break. Wonderful, thank you very much indeed. Okay, well this is embarrassing, so I apologize to my team. <clears throat> Not so much to the rest of the room, but I thought that since we were group number two, we had to talk about item number two. That's why I kept bringing us back. I thought you guys were doing number four, yeah. So we only got about halfway down the list, so. Um, <clears throat> we'll stay late tonight. Except I'm going to the movies with a friend, so we won't stay late tonight. Uh, so one of the things we talked about is a fear of consequences of speaking out. Although I was selecting pen color at the time, and I'm not sure if you meant students or faculty or both. Um, anybody remember? Yeah. Especially if you're junior faculty. Right, right. Risk, basically. Yeah. Really yeah. The issue of mental health uh, on one campus, Utah, Utah or Utah State, Utah, the uh, mental health facilities are completely overwhelmed. And on our campus, they're overwhelmed, but they've also cut back the number of uh, people. So I have no idea how that makes any sense. Um, and we had a long discussion about what do you do when a student comes to your office suicidal. Either they say I'm suicidal or you have a strong gut level feeling that they're suicidal. What do you do? Uh, the campus would say pick up the phone and call the authorities, but you're afraid to do that. And in any case, you have a rapport with this student. So there's that tension between do you do what the campus tells you to do or do you try to walk the student over to the mental health care facility. And we're not sure what to do about that. But we did come up with um, a long list of concerns. Uh, food insecurity is one that probably many of you know about. That wasn't so much a thing when I was a grad student. And I certainly had times of being poor, but I didn't go through days with no food. Um, transportation insecurity. In Mississippi and maybe in some of the more rural areas, which is something I don't necessarily think of, but that's a, a stressor on students. Um, WIC paperwork, was that you saying, Redina? Yeah. Um, students with babies who need to do paperwork to help them out, it's another stressor and it takes minutes away from your day or maybe hours away from your day. So we did talk about um, having an all hands meeting, which I would say should be students and faculty and staff, where you talk about the duck syndrome. What? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, we need to borrow that slide. And I think it's also okay for us faculty to model talking about mental health and, and let the students know that you had a problem sometime, unless you're making up a story. But if you did have some kind of a problem, you don't have to get into details, but let them know you had a problem and you got through it. And you didn't have to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, which is our sort of go-to solution locally. Well, you've got about 30 seconds left. Okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. 
So we were thought we thought we were talking about the political one. And you know, the issue is can you or can you not talk about Trump? Can you or can you not talk about climate change? Should you or should you not? And in a very blue area of the country, I would say, how the hell can you not? And furthermore, the two have some overlap between them. So I just don't know how we as faculty can go through our whole days without talking about this. And yes, some students might come to school wanting to not talk about it, but maybe they can talk about it at home with their families, and they need to talk about it. And I, I'll just end by giving you an anecdote. We had a year, two years ago, when Trump was elected, in the forecasting class, believe it or not, everybody was female. All the juniors, all the seniors, all the grad students, and me. Never happened to before. It'll probably never happen again. But we kind of had a closed door meeting about what the election of Trump meant to us, because some people were in tears. And I mean, I think that's good that we were able to do that. We trusted each other. Yeah, you can keep the rest. Thank you very much. OK, next group. Yeah, I can, I can go, sure. Um, so speaking uh, more broadly to the, the, the top question, how are you creating a supportive environment um, for students in particular? Um, some of us have mentorship programs, both formally and informally, um, particularly through AMS chapters. Um, so various activities, so like uh, students um, hosting other students, doing hikes, barbecues, things like that. Um, we had talked about just being upfront with our students. Um, in some institutions, uh, we have living and learning communities where um, in like departments, the students are actually living together. Um, as faculty, we all um, pretty much have open door policies, so just making sure that the students know that they can drop by whenever they want to talk about something that's either academic or maybe even not academic. Um, we said it's also important to protect uh, efforts for uh, junior faculty. So um, in some of our institutions, like junior faculty don't serve on committees, um, specifically search committees, things like that. So being respectful of their time. Um, and then uh, some of our institutions, we have early alert systems for undergraduate students. So if a student's not doing well, then uh, that is uh, then communicated back to say their advisor. Um, some challenges, we had discussed how um, some FERPA regulations may actually hinder some efforts so that if we, we don't know what's happening with the student or we can't talk to their parents or something like that, that that can be challenging. Um, and we had also talked about challenges uh, kind of more personally for faculty that we have to be careful that there's some faculty um, who students may go to more often, um, either because they're uh, a female in a male-dominated department or um, ethnic um, minority or something like that, that sometimes we'll have a lot of students coming to our office. And that can be a little challenging, because again, we're not trained in that area, and it's not like we have extra time to be dealing with it. And so being mindful of that and trying to figure out some way to work that, um, work that out. Um, and then with respect to how UCAR can help, um, we had talked about maybe uh, providing some guidance for various situations. What do you do when you have a student who is crying uncontrollably in your office? Because again, we're not trained in this area, and so sometimes um, you don't want to like make the situation even worse. And so what can we do in that situation? Um, but also in terms of just mentoring um, younger faculty in the department, we're not necessarily trained in that either, and so just some guidance would be helpful. Thank you so much. We've got two groups left. Right. Yep. Okay. okay, for question bullet one, um, conversations about failure, pressure, and doubt. Um, we felt we need to share information about the doubts, but we don't have enough conversations yet among ourselves and among our students regarding questions that student might have, perhaps creating a frequently asked question web page that answers the student. And we've seen past questions that can help future students. Um, reducing students' stress, have optional homework, and uh, faculty should sit in lectures from other professors to get a sense of how they do things. For the second bullet, do we speak about national news and impacts? Um, some topics of discussion are not allowed by our administration. Didn't get much past that, I don't think. Um, for the third bullet, are we providing e easy access to mental health care and support? Um, so yes, we recognize there is lots of stress. Um, all of 
All of the universities represented at our table have professionals at our universities to which we can refer the students. Um, only one out of five universities at this table offer programs for faculty to be referred to. Um, for example, for early alert of potential problems. Um, but all of the universities at our table um, have some sort of mental health coverage as part of their benefits package. Regarding the fourth bullet, um, supporting a work-life balance, we polled ourselves here. And so one person said 80% um, um, happy with their work-life balance, another person 30%, another person 80%, another person 30%, and one person, 50%, happy with our work-life balance. Uh, we also polled ourselves and realized that four of us are introverts and one is an extrovert. We don't know whether there's some correlation there, but um, that was information. Um, <laughs> regarding student balance, um, if we offer flexibility in due dates and assignments, it might help reduce some of the student stress. And we thought that maybe some of the stress is caused by the American, quote, unquote, mentality of competing for success. I think it's hilarious that you quantified exactly how happy you were with your work life balance. <laughs> Such a scientist thing to do. It's beautiful. Okay, we're the, the last group. Um, nothing super new. Uh, I think we also spent a lot of time on the first question because it was so interesting. Uh, we, we get, like the group over here, uh, talked about how there, we didn't have any systematic way of opening conversations about failure, pressure, and doubt. We relied a lot on students to come to us and that we were open to those discussions, all of us, but then that we didn't find ways to do that. Although we had a couple of examples of ways that you could do it. Um, Daria talked about um, after the first exam, showing a TED talk about perseverance in her class. Um, and uh, some of us also talked about, you know, having those discussions after handing back the first exam and, and uh, how, to, how to manage that. Um, and there were uh, suggestions that we should develop less formal settings uh, for conversations uh, that could range everywhere from inviting people over to your house uh, to even having a beer with students and just getting to know them a little bit. Um, the, uh, with respect to the national news, um, all of us felt that our universities weren't telling us what to do, but none of us were comfortable um, talking about those sorts of things that scientists are supposed to be apolitical and uh, that the subject matter is not relevant to our classes and so bringing those sorts of things up even a school shooting um, might be very difficult to do for us um, and uh, mental health uh, campus resources are known uh, I think everybody knows that but do we know the where the when the how um, and what to do um, and I think I'm not sure we came up with the answers to those questions um, and then work-life balance um, that doesn't exist all right, Although some you. of us are trying to model it. <laughs> so I have two comments on the things that I've heard, and then I want to open up to the floor so we can all just have a conversation about what we want to talk about. Two things especially that a couple of places brought up. Firstly, the fact that we don't have these systemic ways of talking about these kinds of things. I will say that when I first arrived here at this organization, I gave a talk to the ASP postdocs about imposter syndrome. And they all just went to pieces, pretty much, you know. And so it was an amazing conversation because pretty much none of them had heard of imposter syndrome. And I literally had four of them in my office over the, over the following weeks, two of whom were in tears. The others were like, thank you so much for just, like, explaining my entire life, right? <laughs> And so even just having that conversation, the fact that we sat down and even just told them what imposter syndrome was, was enormously relieving for them. So I would strongly encourage you all to have these conversations up front. Don't wait for people to come to you. The second thing is about that piece about um, how do we talk about national news and the fact we need to stay apolitical, okay? It is not political to offer support to students when something like the Pulse Orlando nightclub shooting happens or when something like Charlottesville happens. We can all agree white supremacists are bad, right? That's, that's not a political statement right there. Um, we can all agree that shooting up a, a nightclub full of LGBT people is bad. And so we're not saying you need to get into a, a conversation about gun control. We're saying 
you know, talk to people about how they're feeling, be open to that conversation, because I know here that people were deeply, deeply affected by that. And had we not made space for that conversation, I think there would have been a lot of damage done to our staff here. We actually ended up having listening sessions and having open forum um, to talk about these issues when they happened. So we were very deliberate about that. So it doesn't have to be political. It can be offering support. Yeah. Can we, we find a mic? I think there's a mic on the table just over there. I want to try and model best practices because you never know who in a room is having difficulty hearing. With regard to shootings and lockdowns and things like that, that's handled, at least at Millersville, that's at the university level. I try to stay away from that in the classroom um, if I can. Now, climate change and Trump news is a different issue. I'm completely transparent about addressing those things. But, but th those things are handled, uh, the, the, if something like that happens anywhere in the country, the university immediately, the counseling center immediately opens the door and has, have these, has these various sessions throughout the day that I think adequately handle that. While I have the mic, I just want to say something about the climate change issue. I think we talk about climate change from an evidence-based perspective. I mean, what heck, you know? I mean, that's what it is. You just bring it up, it's evidence-based. You can talk all you want about it. That's quite all right. So I don't want to open the floor to questions, so I, I want to, yeah, yeah, pass, pass around. I want to make sure that the things bubble up that we actually all want to talk about as a group. We've got about 25 minutes. I've been told I can go over a little bit. We told me we can go over a little it bit, just, so let's go. I just can't help myself from saying one thing about the open door policy that's been mentioned over and over and over again. And um, we've had a situation recently where staff and faculty felt threatened so keeping your door open all the time as a policy on whether or not the faculty member is doing a good job might not be the best, best indicator because um, there might be a certain threat against a certain type of faculty member that needs to keep their door closed for a reason. I think that's a valid point. I will also add that even an open door policy doesn't guarantee people are going to come talk to you. Quite often the people who are struggling the most are not going to come to you because they're embarrassed about the fact they're struggling. They don't feel they should be struggling. They're worried that if they're going to come to you that you're going to say you should have known this, okay? Even if we wouldn't actually say that. So bear in mind you often have to keep an eye out for the students who are struggling and go to them. You can't guarantee they're going to come to you. And then instead of a seminar this year, we're doing a mental health um, discussion. This wasn't my idea. It was somebody else's idea. So um, because our mental health um, office is so completely overwhelmed at the University of Utah, they've had an increase of 50% in the last two years, which I guess is norm, like the, the statistics seen across the country. Um, they're encouraging us to take one of our seminar spots and substitute that for um, mental health discussion. I just want to go back to climate change. I think uh, Putting Trump and climate change, they're not the same thing. I, I teach a course on climate change in Texas. We talk about climate change every lecture. I never talk, mention Trump by name. We talk about policies, but they're not the same thing at all. I mean, my whole course, the title is climate change. So, And it's like, if we, we shouldn't talk about climate change. It's like biologists couldn't talk about evolution. I mean, it's fundamental to, I'm not saying taking sides on climate change. Just talking about climate change is not the same. And so some people mention Trump by name in class, but I don't, um, but that's, but so, I mean, it should not be in the same category. And, and I would also say that um, you never know who in your class is going to be a conservative voter, a Republican voter. And so it can be, it can be very alienating to them by you know, getting into this. We, we had actually, a, the culture survey we did here at UCAR, we found that conservatives feel the most excluded from this organization above everybody else, okay, by a large amount. And a lot of that conversation was around the way conservatives are spoken about. And so the, the people, when we did the focus group with, with them, were saying, you know, we don't mind people arguing about the politics. What we object to is people calling us beer-swilling, Trump-voting idiots. That is, and we said, absolutely, that is unacceptable. And that's where the dialogue tends to go. And so, you know, I'd be aware of that, you know, you may well have Trump voters in your class, which you already know, uh, and just making sure that the discussion stays respectful. And I like the idea of talking about climate change without mentioning Trump. I just wanted to go back to the, the having open conversations and, and, and providing access to mental health. Is that most of us are not, have not had any kind of training at all, other than being a human being, in recognizing some of the things that, uh, you know, a student may just be there 
and maybe it's because they're stressed or maybe they're just a quiet student and you don't know and we don't have any training in that regard and our universities are not giving us that kind of training. And I think that's the kind of thing we can talk about in terms of what can UCAR do because that's the kind of thing that we can think about, you know, at this meeting next year, do you want that kind of training? That's the kind of thing that we could create, right? Uh, not necessarily create, but bring in people for, or at AMS or whatever it is you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. If I can piggyback. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, so you mentioned that you talked to the postdocs about imposter syndrome. The doc syndrome came up earlier. Just having fact sheets, informational fact sheets that we can access so that when these things come up or, or when we're trying to express that to the students, that would be very helpful because we don't know. <laughs> you, you can probably be a very very big uh, resource for us in that sense. Okay, so we want to make a list, fact sheets, <laughs> training on maybe like mental health awareness. Well, first with respect to climate change, um, one of the things that I've noticed is that, once again, it, it is a big issue of, quote, it's received political identity. And when I discuss climate change, one of the things I point out is, well, you know, first, ex-climate skeptic, which is kind of like being an ex-smoker. And also, um, I point out the fact that you've got a large Republican, or a noticeable Republican bloc that is, well, pro-climate, pro-action on climate change. So you've got things like the Climate uh, Solutions Caucus and the Citizens Climate Lobby and Bob Ingalls and Jerry Taylor at the Nickerson Institute. And so you start showing that it is, you know, you break down the identity thing and it starts making easier to have a conversation. But on the other stuff, especially the first bullet item and the um, maybe the second, it, I think it would be really nice because you know we're we're the um, we're local. They see us every day. They might be very uncomfortable having conversations with us. Would it be possible? I, I mentioned this to you briefly a few seconds ago, but would it be possible for you to be able to do, for example, a Google hand uh, Google Hangout? with our students or some of our faculty, and not just the ones in atmospheric, but in some of the other departments, where you can discuss some of these things and you don't have you know, the no fun zones and the, the people they're going to see every day who they think are going to be judging them being able to discuss these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm in Rapid City. I could have you visit. be honest, I'd rather visit. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that. Like, I can't visit every single one of your universities, though. So, <laughs> so I think that's the thing we should talk about and figure out if we can do it remotely. I, I, I like that idea, and it's certainly something we could do. So let's put that on our list. Great. Yeah. OK, okay. sounds good. But I was just going to add to what I think Rich is trying to say, too, and uh, what the others of having recorded elements from people in the field, maybe not necessarily local, but if it's yourself giving a talk to ASP or an NCAR senior scientist, because there's a lot of TED Talks, there's a lot of resources online that are just generic people from other disciplines. But we are all working with a lot of students who want to be atmospheric and climate scientists. And so if they can actually see a testimonial from an atmospheric or a climate scientists, uh, even if it's recorded, even if it would be better that it's in person, having something recorded in addition to a fact sheet or whatever else I think would be really nice to have. Uh, Val, do you already provide that for the REU network? Is that something that you do already? I think in our, our in the GEO REU community we have an email list serve and I think we've had conversations like um, think how to talk about after say a police shooting uh, and to be able to say you know I don't to, to a group um, I just want to acknowledge what happened in the in the in this city you know last night and this really horrible thing I don't know what to say about it or I you know I don't I don't know quite what to say but I want you to know that I'm so sorry and that I am here for you or that I I you know I understand that this is really hard um, I don't know, I was going to actually ask, it seems like that might be the kind of, one of those tip sheets, like how do you, if your university doesn't provide the resources that Rich, Rich's university does, and some probably don't get emails sent out like that, like we do here, what, what, can, what can I say as an individual to a class, even if I have no idea, like I really don't have any idea, but I can at least acknowledge the pain that people are feeling. 
And that piece about acknowledging feelings is so important. You don't have to solve it, but at least acknowledging feelings is incredibly important. Yeah. And we can certainly talk about that. I think that's and I think there's also a piece in here of like train the trainer would be really helpful because, you know, mainly maybe we just like get you all together and we train you how to ha do all this stuff rather than me coming and talking to your students. How can you create a safe space within your department so that they want to talk to you? Because even if I come in and have that conversation, if they still don't want to talk to you, we still got a problem, right? So um, I would love to. <laughs> Fair and valid point. <laughs> so I, I think I want to go back to a comment that Eric had made uh, earlier about, we talked a lot about what we do in the classroom, and, and I think that's very important. Uh, some of the most impactful things that I've experienced with students um, has been outside of the classroom, um, whether that's just you know wandering over to the Weather Center just to chat about what, you know, latest satellite image. Like yesterday, if I would have been around the, uh, uh, the university and, and uh, with all the, the hurricane going on, I mean, we all would have been talking immensely, but, you know, sometimes the, the 5.30 at night, I'm kind of getting ready to go, but I just pop in to see how everyone's doing. And, and, and then, you know, there, there, was one or, there was one time when uh, there were two students who appeared to be struggling beyond what they normally did. And, and I actually just, I said, you know, why don't you come to my office? It, kind of out of character for me. It's not more of an introvert than an extrovert. And so I think in a room of introverts, you know, talking to other people just in general is a hard thing. But I think that's that's the humanity piece of it, right? A lot of times it's just having those conversations that you don't even know where it's going to go. It's going to be the, the, hi, hey, how you doing? That may open up a box. And, and that's very scary to me uh, at times because I'm also not willing to <laughs> let that box open. Um, and, and it turns out that I had, I had two students who came in uh, who were both struggling at the same time. And Two, two male criers in the office, and that was that, uh, was not prepared for that on, on the front end. And But I think in the end, I, it, they, they were seniors that year, but it, it really kind of changed whatever was happening in their life. We didn't even go into all the details, but it helped them acknowledge something that they were struggling with that they they could start to, to move past. And so it's those personal interactions that I think could be so powerful that it takes nothing more than just saying, hi, come to my office. Just, you know, no, no premeditated thing. I, I love that. And let me make a book recommendation for you all because uh, a wonderful way for um, just acknowledging and listening is a book called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. It is a wonderful book which really just talks about how you acknowledge emotion, how you problem solve with folks when you're in that, it's, you're not in a parental role necessarily, but that, you know, kind of in loco parentis kind of role. Um, and it talks about how you don't really have to say anything or solve anything. You just go, mm-hmm, yep, I hear you. I hear this is really frustrating for you or very sad for you, you know. And all you have to do is acknowledge. And this is, this, these conversations are a lot easier than you think they are. And so we could absolutely, I mean, they've all run workshops. Why don't we all go to a workshop together, you know, <laughs> um, and figure that out. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's the idea that I think, you know, we're scientists, right? We like to solve problems. So a problem appears at our door. We want to solve the problem. And that's a very hard thing to overcome. Uh, and I think then even listening to yourself. Right through that whole, you know, so using this as a way to listen, where am I at right now? Uh, because we all have the difficult days, and, and then doing this then for our colleagues, right? The other aspect of this, I think we focused a lot on students here, but I think a lot of these interactions also work between ourselves as colleagues. Absolutely. That, that we're all the ducks on the surface and don't want to show the, the underside. Let me say as well, these work great for like spousal relationships as well. So, you know, <laughs> you, know you know, when you, like, you come home and you're like bitching about something, you're really angry about it and your spouse starts to offer solutions. You're like, I don't want you to fix it for me. I just want you to listen. And quite often that's all that students want you to do is to listen. Or convince you that you should uh, gaslighting. There we go, right there. <laughs> And any other thing? Yeah. Any other thing that you kind of want in terms of resources? We've heard about fact sheets. We've heard that don't forget the training at the AMS, okay? We have around about 12 spots left for this training. You can sign up for it when you register. It's a short course on the Sunday. We are finishing in time for the presidential forum, whatever it's called. Um, so, you know, please think about that because we are offering this training here and that will also teach you how to intervene in difficult situations and how to have difficult conversations. That is part of this training. So we teach you like the model for, you know, acknowledging feelings, you know, talking about how you care, talking about what you're seeing, talking about, so there's a list, there's a model. Um, 
We're looking at atmospheric science specific resources and videos for students. Um, yes, and I completely agree with this. We know from all the trainings we've done that scientists talking about diversity and inclusion is way better than other people from outside the community talking about it. And then train the trainers so that we can get your um, the training that you seem to be asking for, if I'm right about that. Is there anything else we can do for you? Yeah. I wanted to make sure. Did I understand there is a training at AMS this year? There is, yes. On Sunday. On Sunday. Ugh, don't, don't ask me that question. Is something about diversity and inclusion for geoscientists, something like that? It's a short course. You can register for it when you sign up. I think we're only charging 50 bucks or something for it. Maybe 25. I don't know. I forget. <laughs> it's not very much money. We are feeding you. Um, yeah. And, and what time during the presentation? Uh, we're, we're stopping in time for that. So you're not going to miss it. Um, the other thing I would say is if you want us to keep offering trainings like this at AMS, please tell the AMS. Um, we're doing it for free this year. In fact, we're actually paying $3,000 for the uh, you know, opportunity to come and train you. <laughs> we can't keep doing that, OK? So if this is something that you really want to do, we are going to have to come to an agreement with AMS where we do get paid to do it, um, because we can't keep doing this. I don't have the budget for it. But if this is something you're really interested in, please talk to AMS and, and request it through them as well, because that way we can um, come and do this more often. I don't know if this is working. Oh. Thank you, Carolyn, and I'm thinking I might come to your training. Um, I, so I just also want to say thank you, everybody, for being open to this topic and being willing to t share with each other. Op it seems very openly about, you know, how much you're paddling underwater. <laughs> yeah, how much time? 30% underwater. Um, so th it's really, it's really kind of moving and inspiring to hear the comments, that, and, and I'm happy that we have them on paper so we can. Um, try to do this. I actually proposed a session at AGU that was called Creating a Supportive Departmental Culture, and it got zero, <laughs> zero submissions. But, you know, it's the AGU. It's not um, a town hall or whatever, not a town hall, but a workshop. So, yes. It's nice to see the, that you guys are open to this. I just wanted to say something that's related to that. I, every time there's an option to go to diversity training, uh, like you have done here in the past. I feel like there's a self-selection of people, you know, the people of color, the people that, that show up to this. And so I appreciate that we are all here as opposed to being able to choose something else. Because I feel like the people that are not affected by it don't feel like it's their job or their problem and will always choose the other thing. And maybe that's unfair, but but that's what I always feel. So. Anyway, thank you. We get a lot of criticism for talk, talking to the choir. The thing is, you don't need to get everybody on board to make a cultural change in your department. You just need a few people on board. And the best thing I can possibly say to you is find your allies in the department. And they may not be the people that you think they're going to be. So one of our strongest allies here at UCAR is actually uh, an ex-Republican. He's very conservative still. Um, he's a white man. Um, and you know, I just didn't expect him, especially because I knew his political leanings, to be one of our biggest allies. Turns out he has a transgender kid. And so he ends up being one of the strongest allies in the work that we do. And he's able to do that translation to other folks in the organization who are conservative, which is great. And so um, I really appreciate him. And, and so often we find allies for this work in places we don't expect them. So I would strongly recommend to all of you, go find your allies and just create these pockets. So what we've been doing here at UCAR is we've been training people in bystander intervention. We've maybe only reached 100 people in a 1,300-person organization. And we, we're spreading it out, but that's all we've reached. I have seen so many situations where those 100 people have stepped in and intervened in problematic situations. We actually had an admin assistant the other day outright say to a director, you know, to a lab director, hey, are you bullying this postdoc? I mean, she literally intervened and called him out. And I was like, holy crap. I can't believe she did that. It was awesome. Um, so we, we see these things happening, and it is changing the culture here. And so you don't need to train everybody. You just need to create seeds, which then, which then grow. Any other final comments, thoughts? It, it just occurred to me, and, it, and it's really not something that I deal with because I'm an undergraduate program. But uh, one thing I did not hear mentioned and considered here is how differently a lot of these 
issues and problems come up when you're dealing with international students that may come from a very, very different perspective, and, and international faculty as well that have a very different idea about diversity and so forth. Yes. <laughs> All right, yes, let's thank, thank our, you, our, our leaders. All right, so this has been an absolutely packed day, and I thank you all for staying uh, engaged uh, in all of our discussions that we've had uh, that have ranged over a wide a variety of things. Uh, we are now moving into uh, the reception out, out in the, the lobby area, and then uh, you'll be able to, you're free to, free to go whenever. Um, tomorrow morning, we will be gathering back in this space. Uh, 8.30 a.m. begins the first session, uh, and we will be talking about uh, atmospheric science education for students' future success, talking about uh, the potential of doing some surveying around uh, what we do, uh, and then as well as uh, taking a chance to, to think back to our bachelor's statement and talk a little bit more about that. The discussion about accreditation and assessment uh, will likely be a part of that conversation. And then we'll wrap up with uh, one last session where we'll have Amanda Adams talk from the NSF about opportunities to fund education initiatives, as well as then basically having a free open discussion at the end for any of these topics that we've discussed here or any other topics that are on your mind that we want to collectively think about and potentially make some actions. And so something that used to happen at these meetings was at the end of the meeting there may be resolutions about things that this body decides, that this workshop decides. So if you uh, have a feeling about something that we want to make a statement on, uh, whether that's to the AMS board in higher education or something like that. We can entertain those types of things at this workshop to make a statement of we think we should the field should move forward in, in this way or charge the AMS board in higher education to have conversations about this, that, or the other thing. So thank you all. Have yourselves a great evening. Uh, we'll go ahead and have a great reception. <laughs>